But the reason that hair elongation happens is because those bacteria, and you can see here the picture to the left, you see all the brown dots, those mm -hmm. are the bacteria. They're producing ethylene and they're also producing nitric oxide, which are two plant hormones. Epicloia is a fungal endophyte that occurs in grasses. And that first picture that I showed you, so the hypha, the blue hypha inside the grass, mm -hmm. that's, this, that's this fungus. You know, we get the idea that all endophytes are good, but yeah, they're good for the plants, but they're not good for animals, right, necessarily. And the plot to the left has an endophyte in it, an epicloia endophyte, the plot to the right doesn't. And you can see that there's disease, a disease called dollar spot all over this. Why do we give supplemental CO2 then when, when the bacteria right after it gets produced out of the nuclei, it starts to secrete nitrogen? Please welcome James White back onto the channel to talk about endomycorrhizae. Make sure to get some popcorn because this is going to be a long one, guys. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Make sure to check us out on Instagram and Facebook. And also, if you don't have the time to get into the video now, in the future we'll be breaking it up into smaller bite-sized pieces. Until then, we're just going to release the whole thing. Let's go ahead and get into the video, guys. Make sure to hit the join button on the bottom of every video. Mr. White, it's a pleasure to have you back on the channel. Please, let's, let's, let's start off with where you wanted to take us today because a okay. lot of people are looking forward to this. I would like to talk about endophytes in general today, and I, I want to go over fungal endophytes and kind of give the background, because plants, plants really are not just plants. They are, they're microbes. You know, some people call it the, the holobiome, right? The, is more frequently used these days, holobiome, meaning there's, it's the plant and it's all the endophytes and the various associates. And it turns out that plants have a lot of microbes in them. And some of these are really interesting. So what is an endophyte? Just to keep, just for someone that's never, never yeah. heard that word before, what is an endophyte? Yeah. An endophyte is a microbe that goes into a plant and doesn't cause disease, or it could also go into a fungus and you could call them an endophyte. So they're any kind of microbe or even if it's not a microbe, I mean, there are some, for example, like a glomus uh, endoratus. Glomus is an endophytic. It has an endophytic component to it. Yeah, those are endophytes. But also things like um, uh, what is it? The uh, parasitic vascular plants, uh, for example, they have a component that goes inside, frequently inside the the plant that they're parasitizing, and so they also can be considered endophytes. So what I want to do, if I can, the important thing about an endophyte, it's a microbe and it does not cause disease. That's the important thing, no disease. So what I want to do is show a few slides, if that's okay. Yes, please. So microbial endophytes of plants and fungi is what I'm going to talk about. And uh, okay, so endophytes, say we've already defined it with your perfect first question. You know, what is an endophyte? Is good thinking. This actually is an image of an endophyte. This is a fungal endophyte, and it's in, in a grass. This is a, a, some grasses like fescue grass and rye grass and uh, some other fine fescues, for example, all have fungal endophytes in some of the, some of the individuals of the species or in populations of the, of the species. And they're well known for people who grow grasses. But also there is this uh, endophyte is not used exclusively for microbes and plants. In medicine, they actually have the, they use the term for a tumor that grows into other tissues. So that it is a, it's a word that can go across fields. But in, in plants, we typically are talking about microbes that go into plants. And it could be any kind. I mean, I already mentioned typically microbes, but it could be algae. And it could also be uh, vascular plants in addition. So, and that fungi is on the, actually the surface of the leaf, not the roots, the picture you were showing us, right? Right. That fungus that I showed is actually in the leaves. Okay. They're That's inside true. the leaves and they, some of these will go into the, onto the leaf as well, into the leaf surface and will sporulate there. Well, I wanted to just take a, a couple of minutes here, show a few slides that just recap what I talked about last time with the rhizophagy cycle because this is happening in roots, right? And so this is all plants are doing this rhizophagy cycle, rhizo for root, phagy for eating. And we talked about that cycle because these microbes are attracted to the root tips and they're internalized into the plant. They're attracted to the tip because the plant is secreting exudates. So the plant is feeding them, attracting them. They go there, they go, they're internalized into the cells. And then the plant uses superoxide 
to get nutrients out of those microbes, to degrade some of the microbes and then to extract nutrients from some of the other microbes. The surviving microbes are replicated and then they will induce root hair elongation and then the plant will essentially eject those microbes out back into the soil, okay? And then they will reform their cell walls and reform their flagella and become soil worthy again so they can go out and swim in the soil. And then later when they're, you know, they'll get nutrients here and then they get attracted back to the root uh, root and then internalized and then the nutrients will be extracted again. So that's a cyclic process. Would you say that oxidation process is, is an enzyme reaction process? Well, it involves an enzyme that produces the superoxide and the enzyme is actually in the the root cells themselves. And it's a, it's one of the NOx or yeah, NOx enzymes. It's a NADPH oxidases, but it takes molecular oxygen from the air and it will produce superoxide, which is a, a form of oxygen that has a little radical a negatively charged electron radical on it. So it'll just zap things, right? It's highly potent, highly potent form of reactive oxygen. This is actually, um, it's less sophisticated than enzymatic processes. This is a, a process that's, I mean, we consider it definitely a chemical process, but it is probably earlier, one of the earlier systems that organisms on earth evolved and it developed, it developed right after we got oxygen in the atmosphere. And if, if, you, if you recall that uh, at one time on earth, we didn't have all this oxygen in the atmosphere. And instead it was, you know, a lot of carbon dioxide and, a, and a, a, nit- a lot of nitrogen and some other gases. And the uh, plants developed mostly algae stromatolites in the early earth, right? Very early on. And then what happened in, before the pre, in the Precambrian or early early in the Precambrian, uh, what what happened was you, you started getting more of these these algae producing oxygen into the atmosphere. And then when the atmosphere became oxygenic, then on the Earth, you know, you had all this rust forming, and people could see Earth in these layers from that age. But at the same time, some organisms learned to take that oxygen and use it to kill other organisms and plants eukaryotes were the was really the the main group of organisms that developed the capacity to do that to take that oxygen and create superoxide uh, that they could then use that defensively or they could use it as a kind of a degrading tool so they could they could uh, kill and get nutrients from other microbes typically uh, prokaryotes. Okay, so this uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. This is the evolution of eukaryotes and and how the role endophytes really had in that. Um, I'll mention that. But this is rhizophagy cycle. Okay, it happens at root tips, and so this is a grass root. You can see all those little tips here. Okay, those are those are where the rhizophagy cycle would happen. So grasses do that a lot, but all plants do it. Okay, and this I've showed this before. This is a root, lateral root, and you can see the bacteria here that are being cultivated by the by the root in exudates. It's secreting exudates, and then it's taking in those microbes into the into the root cells. And that just shows these bacteria in the root cells now. And you can see they're replicating some of them. You can see a little chain, and the plant is hitting them with superoxide at this point. You can see this is a image. One of my graduate students, but what she did was she took the bacterium, she labeled it with a tag, a, a fluorescent tag called M. Cherry, and you could label the DNA with that. You know, do some uh, little little tag it, do some molecular biology to do a little tag, and she put the M. Cherry there. Then she examined it with a confocal microscope, and you can see all those little red dots. Those are the bacteria that are inside the cells. You can see the blue on the outside. That's, that is the cell wall itself. So you can see they're actually inside the plant cells. That's, these are cells from, what is this? Uh, from, I think this is clover. That's a little clover. But the bacteria go through the wall and go into those cells. And I show them here in the periplasmic space because it seems like they stay in the periplasmic space, but not completely. And I'm not going to show much of this, but we have some ultrastructure that shows they'll actually bacteria will actually go into the cytoplasm to some extent. And I will also show some images where they the, go into the, the periplasmic space. That's yeah. is that, and just to kind of 
take that in consideration of like the, you have the phloem, right? The phloem is like the water part. And then you yeah. have, um, and that's mostly where the, cal that's where the calcium, the boron travel, it's that, that type of stuff, if I remember straight. And then you have the sappy layer, right? Phloem is, is for sugar. Phloem is for sugar, but you also have some other nutrients in there. You also have some minerals. So the xylem is for water, the fluid part, like you said. Yeah. And that is where you have some other nutrients that will also travel, but that's where mostly the water will go. But you have you have those nutrients going into both of the both the phloem and the xylem. So and both kind of fluidish, really. And the plasma yeah. membrane, where is that specifically? Uh, like which? If you look here, look at the little the on the outside of the white line. Mm -hmm. That's your plasma membrane. That's your plasma membrane. So. So it's the bacteria are trapped in this space between the plasma, between the cell wall that's gray and the plasma and the and the plasma membrane here. But it's not always there because we can see it. We have some uh, electron microscope images where we can see some of these bacteria going into the cytoplasm. So they're either pulled in or pressed in in some cases, and uh, they can actually go into that cytoplasm. They don't do any damage because the plant is in control of these microbes and they're secreting superoxide on them. And that this two, two O minus, that's the superoxide I'm talking about. Uh, so they, the plant can detect them, put superoxide on them and control them that way, knock their cell walls off, make them, make them so they can't swim, make them if they try to secrete any enzymes out, they get zapped. They get zapped with superoxide. The enzymes break down. So anything that, you know, basically because the eukaryotes, which is a plant, is a eukaryote, because their cells are designed for uh, tolerating and producing superoxide and tolerating superoxide, they're resistant to the superoxide that they produce, but the bacteria are not. They're not resistant to that superoxide. They haven't developed a way to use uh, superoxide. In fact, a lot of these bacteria, uh, at least a whole many of them, are uh, function without oxygen. They 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 grow better in an in anoxic environment, and uh, you know so they really are not tolerant to oxygen. So the plant is able to use this oxygen that it can get out of the atmosphere and manage these uh, bacteria. Really, it's really interesting. It really is. I mean, just the 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 connection between what bacteria do, like you're saying, in in the relationship to you know, you have this tiny little seed and it produces this incomplete plant, and you need the gas that's in the atmosphere and combined with the minerals in the soil to create create something physical, you know. And the bacteria seem to be that thing that that is the connection to allowing things to be touched or in our reality, it seems like. Bacteria, when you think about it, and consider fungi too, the microbes are mobile, right? The plant is not. So the plant in controlling the microbes is able to uh, reach out into the soil where it could not otherwise re reach. And that just, I mean, you know about mycorrhizae, uh, that can do that, but these bacteria also do that, and they can, they will go away from the root, they can go out into the soil, acquire nutrients, and later the plant can call them back, you know, call them back by putting nutrients out there, and attract them back, and then internalize them and extract those nutrients, so the, the plant really, well, the plant is in control of this process, but the plant can manage these microbes in a way that, so that it can get more nutrients than it would be able to get if you didn't have those microbes. And, uh, you know, so nutritionally plants, I mean, I, I, I like to think that, I mean, one could consider that plants are like smart doing this, but of course, you know, this is a process that developed very early on as plants moved into land. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but it's something that plants uh, are just able to do. And uh, they do it. They all do it. The only ones that have kind of given up on doing the rhizophagy cycle are those that can't get oxygen in the roots. And uh, some of those, like, uh, for example, if you consider uh, like pitcher plants or, or Venus flytraps, 
you know, those kind of sundews, for example, they, they're not able, because the soils are flooded, they're not able to get oxygen in the soils, right? They can't mm. get the oxygen. So if they can't get the oxygen there, uh, they have to either pump it down, which, they, which these insectivorous plants tend not to do. Instead, what they've done is they've gone to another system, another whole other level of carnivory in order to get being a predator of insects, for example, uh, in order to get those nutrients that, that most plants can get by attracting microbes from the soil and then degrading those microbes in the rhizophagy process. Uh, but uh, these insectivorous plants uh, aren't able to do that, and they have turned instead to catching, trapping insects and getting the nutrients out of those insects, which is probably, probably good, but not many plants do that, so it probably is not as good as rhizophagy cycle in terms of getting nutrients. So, anyways, that's pretty pretty interesting. There, there also is uh, another effect on plants besides the the nutrient effect from from these microbes, and that is the microbes are important for development. And I I did talk about this last time, but two things: the gravitropic uh, response in roots. Roots normally go down. Without mm -hmm. microbes, they don't. They stay on the surface or they go up. If also what happens if we remove all the microbes, roots don't get root hairs. So root, roots will grow, but they're just naked roots. No hairs form on them. You will have, interestingly, you will have the initials, the root hair initials, but unless there are microbes in those root hair initials, they don't elongate. So really, plants need these microbes in order to develop. Now, why is that that they need them? For example, with the root hair, does that mean that the root hairs are only about processing microbes because the microbes are injected back to the soil in those from those root hairs, tips of the root hairs? But I mean, it could be that they're mostly about that. But likely, the reason these microbes are important is because microbes have always been there, right? In the early development, early evolution, of plants and with roots, uh, there were bacteria all in the soil. So they, they likely had those bacteria there, they could rely on them. And because the bacteria can produce these hormones and they will, they produce hormones that causes elongation, uh, plants relied on them. And so they appear to be necessary for proper development in roots. Okay, this just shows a, a root where we remove the microbes and uh, uh, this is, happens to be a Bermuda grass, but if you look over to the right, you can see the little things poking up there. Those are the root hair initials, but they don't have they don't have microbes in them, so, so they don't elongate. We put the microbe back on, and you can see the hairs now form immediately. And the microbes are are being. I mean, here's another bit older, and you can see all the little brown dots. Those are all the microbes in there. This is stained for for uh, hydrogen peroxide. This is a one of the reactive forms of reactive oxygen. And so wherever that's brown in there, there's hydrogen peroxide and that's around the bacteria. Where the bacteria are, that's where you get these, this reactive oxygen being produced. And uh, that's a close up. It shows the bacteria in a root hair. You can see the spherical things. This is, this is, you know, I'm going to go over this stuff pretty fast, but the reason that hair elongation happens is because those bacteria, and you can see here a picture to the left, you see all the brown dots, those mm -hmm. are the bacteria, they're producing ethylene, and they're also producing nitric oxide, which are two plant hormones, and uh, the microbe then in producing that uh, is causing elongation, and as those cells elongate, nutrients are also going to those microbes and they're being and they're also being ejected out of the of the root hair tip that just shows what's happening this is what a root hair actually looks like when it's living and uh, at the top you can see this is a, through through a microscope image you can see the hair you see the shadows going around those shadows are actually bacteria if you look at the picture below you see the hair and you see now the red in the picture below, those are that's reactive oxygen around the bacteria that are in there. So all those shadows going around, those are the bacteria that are processing, moving around. So the plants are processing these microbes, and uh, and then they're ejecting them out of the tips. This is actually shows that some was bacteria. that was actually one of the slides just to highlight a little bit more around the psychology or just having the knowledge around how fast bacteria like will stop when you when you move them or when you transplant them right 
uh, when you transplant them and then you get them back in the soil, how long is it until they start moving again, right? And then also show, because from our first video, you showed a, almost a, a real life speed. It was slightly sped up, but it wasn't that sped up that much. But you could see just how fast they're traveling uh, into they are, the plant. They're traveling pretty fast. They're traveling, mm -hmm. to give you a number, they're traveling about 10 micrometers per second. 10 micrometers per second. And, and, you know, I mean, that doesn't seem like it's very far, you know, a micrometer is a, is, is a very tiny, tiny measurement, but under a microscope, you can see that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. actually just creeping along under the microscope and you can see them, right? So this is probably two or three times that speed, but that you can actually see them moving under a microscope. And yes, what you said is correct. If you move the plant, you stop this movement. You stop this. This is called cyclosis. And this is a, a, a movement that plants do in some of their cells. Uh, and it, it involves the cytoskeleton. A cytoskeleton is made of protein, microfilaments and microtubules that, that it can move structures around inside using these, this cytoskeleton. And if you move the plant, say you bend this hair, you pull it out of the soil, then this stops. It'll stop. You broke the cytoskeleton and it has to reform. And to answer your question, how many days? You know, I don't know, but it does take it does take time. Uh, I suspect it takes a couple of days for this to start moving again. And it, I mean, you could consider it this. How long does it take a plant to start growing again? I agree. And, uh, totally. Even where it normally yeah. there's always like a two to three day transplant shock we always discuss. But it. It, it's it's what we're talking about right here. Like if there was like, you talk about transplant shock, right? That's just, oh, there's going to be transplant shock. But but when you're critical around your farming, there's certain processes, let's say, let's say you're transplanting, um, you're not going from seeding, you're transplanting plugs into the ground. You definitely want to make sure that that the in some level the water the the you're not transplanting to dry soil it was irrigated you're transplanting most likely uh, after 5 30 in the afternoon to give them a full 12 or 13 hours just to get this process going because if, if there's more stresses on the plant this because i i imagine how exponential of a difference uh, i've been learning recently that once a bacteria completes its uh, coenzyme reaction and it actually produces the enzyme, the enzyme can, can go on and be used hundreds of times before it's actually degraded. So it's like, it's really amazing when you see all these bacteria and then when they complete their coenzyme reaction within a 24 hour process, the enzyme that it, it, it completes can go on to do hundreds of function, uh, like be used a hundred different times possibly. Uh, before it's degraded and, and that and more enzymes are needed in a sense. So I just, I, I think about our first conversation around the time it, they shut down through transplant shock and the speed at what they travel and the essential, the essential you know, the, how essential they are really around certain areas and being more sensitive around, like I said, tra even transplanting, make sure it's done before giving them the maximum amount of time to get back into function, doing their function so that you're minimizing these shock, you're minimizing these things, stresses. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, you know, there is another process that happens in plants that where we think the plants are stimulating nitrogen fixation in these microbes by doing this cyclosis, moving them around what that seems to do, we think, is it will reduce uh, the exposure of indi individual microbes to reactive oxygen and probably to oxygen in general, because this movement may remove some of the oxygen from the air in this in these hairs. And uh, when that happens, the and you see, I mean, I showed you this right where these mm -hmm. microbes are being replicated right mm -hmm. when those microbes are replicated they have to replicate their proteins and uh, to do that they need nitrogen and either the plant is giving them nitrogen or they're fixing nitrogen 
And it is logical that, the, you know, knowing how this process is working, you know, looking at the whole process, that this is a place where the plant may be forcing microbes to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere because plants can't get it, right? Plants mm -hmm. don't have nitrogenase, they can't get it. But with these microbes, they do have it and uh, they can, they can po potentially, you know, it's very difficult to know for 100% certain that nitrogen fixation is happening in these root hairs, but very likely there is nitrogen fixation happening in these root hairs. And uh, the mechanism makes sense and that plants would need to do that would make sense because wherever they you know plants have this major need for nitrogen and so because they're taking in a lot of microbes that are able to fix nitrogen it's quite possible that uh, at least some of the nitrogen that plants are getting and people have assumed this for a long time is coming from these bacteria that are internalized into the into the cells because I mean we can see the interactions and we can see that plants appear to be milking nutrients out of these out of these bacteria, particularly nitrogen. I mean we can stain for nitrogen and see that, but I mean there's still questions, but uh, the process seems clear and it seems to involve that cyclosis that we were talking about. That seems to be important for nitrogen fixation in these in these roots we did write a paper about that uh, published it last year but this is essentially what's happening in the root this is a little diagram that shows okay so what what's happening here this shows ejection from the root hair but i mean you can see the cyclosis happening in and what happens is the microbes are replicated and then they accumulate at the tip because the tip is kind of soft and and very elastic right so it it accumulates there and uh, and then uh, and then when they are accumulating in mass there at the tip, they secrete ethylene and they'll also secrete nitric oxide. And that causes the root hair to grow. When that root hair grows, it will eject those microbes out of little pores in the tip. And you can saw, see the diagrams there. And then, of course, they go back to the soil and go out and get more nutrients. The ones that are left inside get pulled back and then they're moved around again with cyclosis and then they're replicated again and then they accumulate in a tip again. So this just keeps happening like this. You know? This is like plant fracking. It is, it is. Yeah. Step wise, step wise, it'll do an eject, a really cool, mm -hmm. cool process. And we can see, actually I saw a film that somebody shared with me. Uh, Harriet Mella is the lady in, in Switzerland that showed me showed me this, but she pulled offline where someone had an image of root hair growing. And you can see actually, as it was growing, you could see the little spurts, the little, the little growth spurt and another growth spurt and another growth spurt and another, and you could almost see it looked like there was lighter areas where the microbes were in there. So you could actually see, it looked like you could see the, the rise of AG process and ejections happening wow. sequentially like this. It was really cool. If you notice, if you look at the old literature, images of uh, that people, they're usually unstained, but you could see the bacteria in things like root hairs. And, you know, there's some very old literature where biologists were very, just, I mean, they're really good observers and very careful describers. And they, and they would illustrate what I interpret to be bacteria in there, but they, of course, they didn't know they were in there. And they would also illustrate in some cases bacteria on the surface, but they didn't realize, they didn't know where they were coming from. There's a kind of a mental block, really, when you start talking about organisms inside other organisms, mm -hmm. right? I mean, because people, they're not supposed to be there. So it becomes, uh, you know, it's hard for people to envision. Yeah, the thought that I've heard many times that we're like, 80% microbes or 90% microbes, you know. Yes, especially so. if you look at numbers. If you look at the numbers of microbes, we are more microbes. We are mostly microbes. <laughs> we're mostly microbes, really, if you think about it. We're yeah. mostly microbes. This actually shows a an ejection from a tomato and mm. a, a root hairs. And if you look at three, you can see three little holes at the tip there where these bacteria are being ejected out. And, and, and you, you also realize that in order for this to happen, they have to be without their cell walls inside, because if they have their cell walls, they're going to plug up these mm -hmm. root hairs. They're going to plug up the root hairs and they're not going to eject properly. So uh, they have to be, there has to be like a Goldilocks 
state for these bacteria in which they are, uh, are susceptible to oxidation to the point that they'll get their cell walls removed and they'll be under control of the plant, but they cannot be uh, so susceptible that they're fully degraded. Now, some microbes may be fully degraded. There may be some that just disappear and we don't see them again once they go in. But uh, the ones that are cycling are the ones that are in that goldy kind of Goldilocks spot, right? Where they're res just resistant enough and susceptible enough to be usable by the plant. And, and all those cell walls reform, right? When they're being re-injected re back into the soil. All of, them reform. all of them reform. All of them reform. It is really amazing. And not only that, <laughs> when this ejection happens, there's a few nutrients. There's some nutrients. There's some exudates that go out with the microbes. And so those nutrients can be used to reform, to regrow the cell walls and re regrow the bacteria and make them co soil competent again. I have a friend of Jeff Lowenfels who wrote this book, uh, Teeming with Microbes and Teeming with Fungi. And now he's writing one, Teeming with Bacteria. But he says the, the process, the rhizophagy cycle is like uh, ranching. And that plants are like ranching microbes in that they're bringing the microbes in, uh, in sh shearing off their walls, their cell walls, right? Extracting nutrients out of them, then, a, then putting them back out in the pasture to get more, you know, like sheep, get and more it, wool, right? And to, so the word cell wall, it, it, it's like, should be, I don't want to say it should be, but it, it just feels... Like when you use the word wall, it, it sounds so strong and structured, but it's not actually. It seems to just kind of be like a belt that the bacteria put their nutrients in as they're circling around or doing their job. And then they just take the belt off and, you know, and get a new belt put back on. And it doesn't even feel, seem like a cell wall. It seems more, like it just seems like that's the wrong word for how easily it can be taken off and put back it on. Can't, it can be easily taken off. It wow. can be easily taken off. I mean, you're right about that. And, and, and then put back on. You're right. In fact, uh, it was medical biologists, medical researchers who discovered them uh, at the Lister, Lister Institute uh, in France, right? And, mm. uh, and what they found was that some bacteria were losing their walls and they're forming, especially in certain disease types of, of diseases, they found that, that the bacteria are losing their walls and they're forming these protoplast phases and becoming spherical, uh, you know, so the, so the L form, they, they're the ones who named this, fa this phase that the bacteria, the wallless phase, they named them L forms for Lister Institute, wow. L -form, Lister forms, right? But it comes out of medicine. And uh, you can actually just put like some of these bacteria, just put them in antibiotic and they'll drop their wall right away and survive. You know, it's that easy to get them to do that. Plants, wow. you see them in plants and I'll talk about them in plants, but uh, it, also some diseases, human diseases like arthritis uh, have been proposed by some like rheumatoid arthritis. There's one biologist from the 60s, I think it was, who suggested that he, f he found actually L forms coming out of some of these arthritic bones. And uh, he, he, he said that uh, his hypothesis actually was that uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, may be caused by these l form bacteria that go in. And it actually makes a lot of sense. You know, these microbes go in, the body recognizes them as foreign. I mean, we consider that to be a, what do they call it? A, a inflammation. A inflammation type disease, autoimmunity dysfunction right auto so it ha it's what happens when, right. when you eat cheese your body goes through an inflammation process yeah well yeah. that interesting interestingly i mean they could a lot of these things could be microbial uh linked even even uh like arthritis very interesting which which may be the endophytes which may be you know we're not going to talk about endophytes in animals we mentioned it here and there but yeah i mean it could be uh, a, in a sense, uh, like an end of, end of, I mean, I think that animals, we're not like plants in that we have this whole other acquired immune response to try to control these microbes throughout our systems. Plants don't really have this acquired immune system. They use exclusively the superoxide system, but 
uh -huh. the reactive oxygen system. Go ahead, Mark. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. No, it's you, okay. you this is such a phenomenal class. How much do you know about bug bug management of how they get attracted to plant um, how they get attracted to plants, supposedly? Yeah, a little bit. I know a little bit about it. Yeah. Okay, so tell me if I get any of this wrong. Um, to my understanding, the reasons why a lot of bugs are attracted to plants is because the plants don't complete their coenzyme reactions within the 24-hour period. And, and then the, like the enzymes left over are the enzymes that the bugs need because of their digestive process or something along those lines. Well, usually, maybe. I mean, uh, you may be referring to something that I'm, I'm not fully aware of because after all, I do work on plants and microbes, right? But, but one thing, I can tell you one thing that attracts insects to plants is that typically there's some kind of a signal that they're picking up on. You know, either it's uh, something, uh, for example, spermidine or some other uh, volatile Ver uh, organic pheromone, some other compound, hmm. some something that is being released by the plant. Maybe it's a signal for an injury or it's a stress, something that's released from the plant during stress. And then the, a lot of times these insects can pick up on that and then they go there and then they attack this plant that may be weakened a little bit already. And well, going along with what you're saying, kind of there, I think you, you and this other um, thing the way I just described actually are saying the exact same thing right if after 24 hours probably a fermentation process start begins to happen if yeah. it's not being used up but exactly what you're saying yeah. is smell begins to come off. yeah a smell comes off something start that you're right things start to happen and you're the right you're right pick up on that they can pick up on that and they can pick <laughs> up on that yeah and going back to our gut now right yeah. because yeah. like uh, to my understanding you begin to produce bacteria in your mouth when you start to chew. And then the bacteria through the chewing of the food mixes with your food. It goes down to your acids. It tears apart the food. And then the bacteria, and then in an alkaline environment from your, uh, from basically from your, when it passes your stomach all the way to your colon, it becomes alkaline through the sodium bicarb of the bile. And what we were kind of discussing a second ago, if the bacteria is, it, if we don't chew, that I was told once that we have to chew our food 40 times before we swallow. And I'm wondering if our the bacteria, you know, like you're saying, arthritis is, is being caused possibly by, by bacteria. And if bacteria, I'm wondering if the bacteria, if there's not, I don't know, I'm just thinking that connection between minerals and bacteria in our, in our, in our gut and illness right now. And I thought, anyways, we can continue, but I thought that was there's. Well, I could say something about that, Mark. Okay. So with that, I, I kind of alluded to this with animals, there tends to be, you know, we have this acquired immune system and for animals, there is a, there appears to at least be a, an effort to maintain those bacteria where they're supposed to be right in the gut because we mostly use them in the gut. I mean, we have microbes all over us. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. They're all over us. But I think in our in our tissues, and in the, the main part, the place that we use the microbes is actually in the gut. And we need them there not only to, well, we need them there to prime our immune systems, right? Because there's mm -hmm. part of our immune system. There's a gut. There's a gut. There's also, you know, it also connects to the nervous system. And, we, you know, all the recent literature about that. It's very important. So developmentally, and they say that developmentally, those microbes have to be in the gut in order for our, our bodies to develop properly and our immune system to develop properly early in, in the first, you know, three years of life, something like that, right? Early on. Uh, but we have microbes, you know, we continue to acquire microbes in our guts all the time. We start to have problems when people get old, and what happens is our, our immune systems in our gut uh, are that maintain the microbes there starts to weaken and they start to escape and they get into the lymph system. They get into, they go out of the gut and they go into the lymph system. And then they'll, they, they may enter 
cells, uh, for example, leukocytes or some kind of cells, cells that they could go inside. Some cells, you know, we have cells that suck them in. And if they're resistant enough, it, they don't kill them. They just ride in there, maybe as an L form or something like that as a protoplast form. And then they can go throughout the whole body and even to the brain. So we have these diseases, lungs, where it goes into the lungs and the brain, sar sarcoidosis and stuff like that, where the microbes get out of the uh, you know, move through the body. They go throughout the body. And even with the, with the, you know, we tend not to have our, those problems with like a rheumatoid arthritis when we're younger, it's when we get older and start, but that also probably is where these microbes have escaped, escaped from the gut and moved through the body. And this is just something that happens. And we have it, we even have like fossils, Neanderthal fossils, where they show that they have really bad arthritis. Now, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or something else, I don't know. But they, you know, they always talk about from these bones that uh, there are certain certain of these, especially the older ones, have bad arthritis and all kinds of other problems. And it could be due to that uh, escaping microbes as we age. Wow. Yeah, interesting. But plants are different. Plants plants will s spread them all over, all over the all over the structure and uh, all over the plant structure. So we know with rhizophagy that it's a nutrient process, at least our data that we have. We've done a number of experiments and we know that if we have the microbes there, plants get a lot of nutrients. If we, if we don't have the microbes there, then they get much less nutrient. They develop improperly, but of course they also develop improperly. So how do you separate, how do you do a a perfect experiment where you have plants that have developed the same amount with and without microbes. That's hard to do because they need the microbes for better development. So, but anyways, this, this is an experiment that shows with rhizophagy with microbes, you can see all the roots that they get and how big the plants are compared to those where the microbes are removed. So those microbes make a big difference in plant growth. Just looking at individual nutrients now, look at nitrogen, you know, with the microbes is higher. Here's without. So it's not like plants can't get any nutrients without the microbes. They can, but they're compromised in the amounts of nutrients they get and probably the, the reach that they have into the soil. And it also affects plants in development tremendously. Phosphorus, you can see with microbes here. You can see these bacillus species here to the right and without there. I'm just going to real fast. Potassium, you can see it's really important for potassium, but that one microbe there gave it a lot of potassium compared to the no microbe. And these others give it a less, a little bit less, but still more potassium than the control. Wow. And potassium, it, 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 potassium is actually one of the nutrients that are inside these bacteria. So it's in the cytoplasm of the bacteria. You know, what was really interesting about that too is they talk about how potassium is so water soluble and available to the plant. And when you when you go back and look at those other slides, it actually shows the uptake when there's no bacteria, much yeah. less than all the other ones like nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, yeah. And that's just really interesting yeah. because they say yeah. potassium is so water soluble and it might be water soluble, but it seems like it's not available. That's right. It may not be available. I mean, there, it, there may be, it may be in a form so that it's not as soluble, especially if it's locked up in the microbe, you know, mm -hmm. these microbes, these microbes can get it, you know, they can get it if it's out there for certain. I, I mean, more than likely where, where we didn't put bacteria, this is solubilized, right? So this mm -hmm. much is soluble, but it looks like where the bacteria is at, it looks like, uh, you know, you get so much more. So, you know, I mean, some of that could also be microbe going out into the soil and then solubilizing it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have some of that happening. And we know that happens with phosphorus, you know, so it could also be happening with uh, potassium as well. And uh, calcium, mm -hmm. and you see calcium is actually uh, one, of the, one of the substances, uh, elements in the cell walls of bacteria and uh, gives them some structure. And of course, it's also in the, in the, in the plant and enzymes and so forth in different parts of the plant, but cell walls have a lot of calcium in it. It's just like a structural compound that helps walls to become stiff, right? Structural well, component. The calcium is also another very interesting one too, because everyone talks about how essential it is. And 
And I think a lot of people talk about um, uh, phosphorus not being uptaken by the plant, or you'll see a deficiency when it gets too warm. Well, how I read the plants is that you're running, in, to my understanding, calcium stops flowing at uh, around 86 degrees. And, and it begins to sink lower to the plant. It, it begins to go to the lower leaves if it gets too warm. Uh, and the relationship between the calcium and phosphorus, calcium being the main cation and the phosphorus being the main ion, it's like if they're not flowing together like a magnet, then everything else isn't kind of flowing behind it evenly. Well, you're, uh, these nutrients do move around in plants, like you say. Calcium, by the way, is important in the cell walls of, of plants, too. Mm -hmm. It's It hardens those cell walls, so it's an important structural component. Yeah, so magnesium, this is another one that's impacted, and you can see you know, it's just mm. slight impacts, but it's impacted. It looks like 30% impact. Zinc, another wow. one. Just about any nutrient you look at is impacted by presence of the microbe and rhizophagy cycle. So what I wanted to do, if it's okay, I just wanted to recap that. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's okay, Mark, then I wanted to talk about, you know, the fossil record and evolution of endophytes. Just kind of talk a little bit about that to give kind of an evolutionary picture. We've already alluded to that a little bit, but if it's okay... Please, please. Okay, okay. So there is a fossil record. It's not very good with endophytes, though, because you know fossils are are really hit and miss, and you only have some. You know, they're only preserved in certain places, rarely preserved, and only in certain places, right? So you have to find these fossil uh, formations uh, in order to to look if there's endophytes there. So, so fossils are very spotty, but this is, I'm actually showing one of the earliest, this is actually an animal here. And this is from the, from the Precambrian. Okay, this is at the time, Precambrian in the, the evolution was the time when you have this explosion of organisms, right? People, organisms came on land, animals and plants started appearing on the land. Uh, mega, multicellular organisms started to appear. So this is one of these very early multicellular, they think, well, they don't know if it's a, a animal or a plant really, but they have classified it as a, as a very primitive uh, animal. And they classified it like that because it resembles, you see it's multi kind of globular, spherical, like a ball composed of multiple cells like that. That kind of looks like, you know, if you think of an animal embryo, uh, it goes through this blastula phase in which it's multicellular ball, right? Before it forms like the, the embryo that looks like a human or fish or whatever it is. Uh, it goes through this phase, the spherical phase. And these fossils were found uh, in China, actually. That, and they think they were, they were located in biofilms of bacteria, mm. bacterial biofilms. And uh, it's thought that this may have been one of the early eukaryotes that became started to become multicellular. That uh, that that in the early evolution of eukaryotes, this was one of the first organisms, and it didn't eat. Instead, it lived in these biofilms, bacterial so, prokaryotic biofilms. So this is a fossilized fungi. It's, it's not clear what it is. This is before you had animals and before you had plants, before you had fungi. This is one of the earliest multicellular forms of, uh, you know, so this, this, would, this would really, I mean, maybe, maybe it's not animal, plant, or fungus. It's, it's, it's a eukaryote that has some features. It doesn't have cell walls, so you, you wouldn't say, okay, Plants have cell walls, it's not that. It doesn't have, and fungi tend to have cell walls. It's, it's not that, it doesn't have any cell walls. Animals don't have cell walls, okay? So we don't have a cell wall here. Uh, so maybe you could say it's like an animal, but it's not like any animal we know. It's, a, it's something that lived in these, you know, that early earth was a lot of prokaryotes, right? A lot of little, little tiny little things and they were doing their thing. And this formed inside those little pools, those little biofilms, those little collections of prokaryotes. 
and they were probably I mean, I think if you look at you look at the actually this is a, a section through it over here to the left. This is a fossil called Megasphera, and it's this early, early organism. You can see the yellow around it. Those are all the bacteria, or at least it's interpreted as bacteria that may be around that. And those little holes in the looks like in the surface, there, there may be bacteria that were going in to these. This may have been degrading uh, these bacteria. It may have been a kind of rhizophagy that these early animal oh. may have been doing a kind of very early rhizophagy right just internalize these microbes break them down also absorbing nutrients osmotrophically getting just absorbing nutrients that were leaking out of these other organisms so this was before plants evolved before animals got guts and so forth this is the very earliest so in this phase and just to put this kind of in an evolutionary phase in this phase, this is before the gut evolved. And mm. at this phase, these eukaryotes or ancestors, if this is ancestor to humans, it lived in a bacterial pool, right? Uh, but as animals evolved, we put that pool inside of us, right? Inside our guts. We carry that biofilm, that microbial biofilm around with us. We still, we still depend on it but we hold it inside our, our bodies in these intestinal tracts, right? Where all these microbes, instead of, instead of living in it, like this megasphera did, right? It lived in these, in the, inside the uh, pool or biofilm of these bacteria, essentially, and fed on those bacteria. I mean, that was, these don't exist anymore. They're known from China. The guy, uh, Dr. Chin, something, and his group over the past 15 years or so have been digging these up. Looks like, what is it, 2014. So that was, this is from a paper down there. But these are from the Precambrian. So it, it, they are before life emerged, erupted onto land as big mega fossils and complex organisms. So this is a very early, early, early one. And when the plants finally came on land, you can see they had endophytes in them. And this is one of those. It's kind of, it's kind yeah. of amazing that you, that kind of shows that a, a, bi, a biology can turn to rock. I yeah. guess we already see that in petrified wood already, but it, but that's to see that on the organism side, it's like, it's like in some level, you know, a, yeah. I mean, I guess we see it all the time with shells turning to petrified wood. I mean, human beings can even be petrified over time, possibly. Is that? Oh, yeah. But we have people, you know, humans who spend their lives studying these little fossil formations, trying to figure out what it was like what things look like. And they add tremendously. I mean, you know, these fossils, to see a fossil, you know, it, 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 especially a reconstruction from it, like you're seeing here, the diagram that's done. This was actually an early plant. This is one of the first plants that came on land, right? These plants, they have no leaves. They had no leaves. Leaves had to evolve later. They had no roots. These are stems that lie down. You see it, this nothea, Mm -hmm. This is a stem that la that laid down. So you you and I would call it a rhizome, right? And then you have these little rhizoids. They're just ex they're just extensions. They're not really roots. These are not roots. Roots have not evolved yet. And then they don't have seeds. It looks like flowers, right? But these are actually spores in there. These are little sporangia. So mm -hmm. seeds hadn't evolved. These are early, 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 very primitive land plants as they came onto land and they had endophytes in them we know that from the from the fossil from the fossils and you can see i mean you see this beautiful diagram here and i mean i i i i studied fossils for a year and a half actually with the paleobotanist many years ago but looking at fossil fungi and i i know it i i share the same kind of amazement that, that you can look at these at these fossils and they can learn something about how life used to be. And uh, this is to the left now. You can see this is an actual bit of tissue. These are these are actually sections. They, these are these plants were embedded in rock, right? In probably 
chert or flint type rocks, right? So they're really hard rocks, but they're embedded in it. It's thought that like a volcanic eruption or something, these were growing around a pond or something like that and a volcanic eruption happened. And then there was silica that dissolved in the water and it went around the plant material that was around the pool of water. And then it solidified it, it preserved it and then it solidified into rock and you get flint. And of course the Indians would use that, the natives Indians, the primitive humans for you know hundreds of thousands of years use that to, to create weapons. But there's fossils in that, at least in some of it. And this shows some of that. And uh, uh, these are sections. And what they do is they cut the rock with a diamond knife. They grind it down using carborundum, just polish it, polish it. And then they etch it, the rock with acid hydrofluoric acid and it eats away some of the rock and then they put acetate on that just like almost like uh, they just melt a sheet of acetate on it dry that and then peel it and do these peels and they look at that with a microscope and you can see this stuff and wow. everything you're seeing here is from that peel which is basically a section through the rock and this was plants embedded in that rock and you can see these little spherical things those actually are endophytes wow. inside inside that plant tissue yeah. Can see all those little dots in there. Those are some ki kind of endophytes interpreted as, as maybe a type of a fungal endophyte that's in that. Bacteria are harder to see. Here's another plant. This is Horneophyton again, very early on. This is like 400 million years old, really. And you can see it's the same kind of thing. You see it. So that's a 400 million year old fungi right there? A 400, yes, it is inside. Wow. There, but to the right, that's a 400 million year old plant, this horneophyton. Uh, and, but inside over here, those are the fungi. You can see a hypha there, little arrows there, little spherical things that's supposed, to, that's thought to be a spore of the fungus. Something like a VA mycorrhizae, right? Like a VA mycorrhiza may, inside the plant. This also, this primitive, this is very primitive. No leaves, no roots, just these little rhizoids that stuck out. They're not roots. They're not multicellular. I think they're unicellular or they may be multicellular, but they don't, they're not developed. And there's no seeds here either. These, these early plants, they really were very primitive. They, they don't really have enough structure to get very many nutrients out of the ground when you think about it. I mean, plants at this stage of development are thought when they first moved to land, they're thought to have had to have endophytes, various kind of endophytes like VA mycorrhizae helping them and bacteria also helping them to acquire nutrients. So more than likely, they were very active. They're, they're uh, like, they seem like they're all aspens. You know what I mean? Do you know how like an aspen tree, they're all yeah. like one, it's all yeah. one organism, you know, yeah. just... And it yeah. doesn't, it just feels, it just feels like an aspen oh. species connection or something. Maybe, maybe they're clonal too, right? That's maybe what one thing is they could connect. You can see a, at the bottom, you have a stem, right? Yeah. Those stems probably connected together. And so you probably did exactly what you say. You probably had a clone mm -hmm. that were just genetically uniform and uh, probably cultivating fungi and bacteria as dendrophytes and doing its own primitive early version of rhizophagy to get nutrients out of bacteria. Wow. I mean, so this is likely, likely happening, although it's hard to see, you know, from the fossils because they're, this just shows more. This is from the Rhiney chert. This is almost 400 million years old, but you can see this is a fungus now where you have another fungus inside it. So this is a fungus and a fungus. Uh, parasitizing. So these, uh, you have these, this is pretty old. You have this theme over and over again. Here's wow. another kind of fossil. This is a thought to be a fungus that's now extinct. This is one called Traquaria. Traquaria, and I don't have it written here, but it, you can see it's a weird pattern. We don't have anything like it on earth today. So this fungus group is gone, but you can see, you can see one of the structures and you see there's fungi now inside it. So here too, you can see one of those structures, you see fungi inside it here. And D too, you can see them. And you see a pollen grain over here. So you had in this case, this is carboniferous. So we have uh, pines and, and conifers developed at this point. And that's a pollen grain there. And you can see there's something inside it. That's probably a chytrid. 
And you know, it is well known that eukaryotes developed through one of our primary ideas here is one called endosymbiotic theory. And that is you have a eukaryote because you had a, an archaean that consumed uh, bacteria and some of those bacteria became mitochondria. And then in time, those archaeans with now mitochondria in them, you can call it a, pro, a proto-eukaryotic eukaryote, organism, or at least it's a eukaryote with a mitochondrion, consumed algae and, and, alga, and alga, and then those algae stopped being degraded at some point, and they became chloroplasts, and you have plants develop. So in the one, one way, you have the mitochondria develop, and that diverges to plants, and then it'll diverge to animals, you know, where you don't get the chloroplasts. And so you have these two different, but this, this endosymbiotic hypothesis uh, was uh, actually proposed very early on by Andreas Schimper, 1883, a long time ago, but was popularized and really more than popularized, was studied extensively and discussed extensively by Lynn Margulis, who you may have heard about. She, she died, she's dead now, but she spent many, many years talking about this, how eukaryotes evolved and looking at how uh, essentially endophytes turned into a whole group of plants. I mean, my, uh, organisms that developed endophytism of these other uh, organ microbes then became this whole, these other groups of organisms, animals and plants and fungi, you know, so this ev evolution of eukaryote called endosymbiotic theory, basically serial endosymbiosis. But basically we're talking about endophytes, taking endophytes and holding those endophytes for a period of time. Probably they were degrading them. You know, we talked about on Earth about how if, um, you know, like the white rhino, supposedly it, was, it went extinct um, five years ago and different types of animal species going extinct, you know, and it's just also the same thing also on the bacteria level, you know, some bacteria will over time will go extinct and life somehow continues to keep pressing forward. Yes, especially with more with organisms that have become more dependent on a niche, right? Mm -hmm. Like animals, like humans, you know, we we're dependent on a particular niche. And uh, if we destroy that niche, we're cooked, you know? So if we destroy our planet, our green planet, we are cooked, or if we poison it, right? We're gonna be cooked. We make it, we make it so we can't grow crops anymore. If we mess up our air, if we mess up our oceans, if we mess up our oceans, we pollute our oceans and our water bodies so that they don't produce oxygen. We kill our, our algae there and they don't produce oxygen or we create you know, other processes, eutrophication or something where we kill all the organisms, all the fish say, because we put too much nitrogen in the ocean and algae grow and then they consume, you know, they'll produce a lot of oxygen and then, and then uh, other organisms will come in and, uh, you know, the, the algae will die and other organisms will come in and break those bodies of those plant, those algae down, and that'll then consume all the oxygen, which will then lead to all the animals dying. And once, we, once we've destroyed our oceans, you know, and uh, polluted our, you know, you get the we, picture. We're we get in a, trouble then. We get a new type of bacteria. We will. We will. <laughs> Coming out of us, possibly. <laughs> Yes, yes, they will. And uh, something else will come to replace us. But, Absolutely. you know, the mycorrhizae, this is something you pointed out. The VA mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae are endophytes, endophytes, they're kind of endophytes. And so the VA mycorrhizae, you know, they go in the roots, but then they go out into the soil and they function to essentially extend the reach of the plant. Okay, same with rhizophagy cycle. You extend the reach of the plant using motile organisms. Now... There is something really interesting that you probably have never heard before. And it's this, the fact that if you look at eukaryotes like people or like plants, what you see is that the, you have this 
And, and you compare that to more primitive organisms, you see that we have more advanced organisms, we have more genes. And uh, if you look, just counting the number of genes, you, you see there for, for like Homo sapiens, you see a huge number of genes there. Three, three, what is it? 3,200,000 genes average compared to our bacteria like Buchnera or, or Staph aureus, you know, you got like almost 3,000 and Staph, Staphylococcus aureus there. So almost 3,000 there compared to our 3,200,000. Okay, so we have more genes. Well, as it turns out, when you look at those genes, they're from other organisms. They're from microbes. At huh. least there's tracks of evidence that they actually are derived from different uh, groups. And so if you look at- They, they uh, set up shop, the whole community on you. It seems like it. It seems like it. We took their genes- we took their genes. So it may have been one of the things that was happening on the early earth in early evolution. We may have had a kind of rhizophagy happening where these early eukaryotes were consuming these prokaryotes, consuming their neighbors. And uh, what you see is this, for example, the bacterial genes go into for eukaryotes, like animals and plants and fungi, they become the operational genes, and that is the genes that uh, run metabolism in the organism, right? They'll, they'll uh, produce the enzymes and things like that that, 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 organ, that eukaryotes have that appear, you know, they track back, you can track many of them back to prokaryotic ancestors. And the, the archaebacteria is thought to be the 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 ancestor of the eukaryotes it was the like the host right that 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 started consuming these bacteria but these archaebacterial genes become the informational genes they have to do with the nucleus and if that was the the nucleus the dna of the of the of the eukaryote and so uh, that was the host essentially that was the primitive the pre eukaryote this one that was so those those genes come from archaebacteria so it, it kind of makes sense. In fact, this has been called the Janus paradox and uh, coined by James Lake. But the Janus paradox, meaning there's uh, two faces, and this is named for the Roman god of beginnings, transition, endings. This is the symbol, the two faces, right? The two faces. So you have your prokaryotic face of the eukaryote, and you have your, I mean, you have your, pro, you have your bacterial face, Right, the eubacterium, and then you have your archaeal face of the eukaryotes from the from the initial host, and uh, you have both. In so we are the result of these continued internalization of genes coming from bacteria, bacterial sources, typically from these prokaryotic sources that end up in us and plants and fungi. It's fascinating when you think about it. It gives you, a, yeah. No, it's 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 a it's exactly what we we're talking about earlier. It seems it seems like the bacteria are we like we, we have gas and I call it the ether. We have the ether, just st some it's a yeah, stuff we can, you know what I mean yep, we can't touch you but yep. we see yep. but it's there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then we have rock based minerals, right? Like like physical structure and what brings these things together and what creates reality, it seems like, is bacteria. And like you say, we're the result of the function of these bacteria and fungi doing their job. And it's like, it's like, it's, I'm wondering if we came from monkeys now at this point, did we actually come from bacteria? Yeah. Well, we come from, we do. We do. We come from all that early life that was combined, recombined in ways, not just by, you know, putting together, but through this, you know, this, uh, this, cons this process of, uh, of internalizing other microbes. I mean, that's how you see, I mean, I call it rhizophagy, right? Because we're talking about roots, right? It's a kind of rhizophagy process where uh, organism, one organism is consuming another organism. And uh, so that was, that was happening. And I mean, the, even fungi, 
may the structure of fungi may have involved this internalization of bacteria or protection from it to some extent uh, or control of it. Because for example, the production of cell walls that fungi have, of course you say, well, those cell walls may be necessary to make a hypha, so it can, and that may be true. But when you look at something like septa, you know, I mean, we have a lot of back, a lot of fungi that have hyphae, mycelium that doesn't have any septa or cell walls, right? That, and, and what happens here, bacteria can get in, it can just spread throughout the hyphae. It gets in typically at the, and I'll show you pictures of that, where it gets in at the, at, at, at the, in the hypha, it'll go in and, and then it can spread throughout and move throughout. And so we know that, that a lot of fungi that don't have cell walls, like zygomycetes or like BA mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae can get bacteria in there and they're these endohyphal bacteria that spread throughout. But then you have these septa that form, these cross walls. And why did they need that? Well, as it turns out that, you know, oftentimes the septum is incomplete and there's a hole there. So anything can go between it. Uh, but bacteria can't spread easily between the cells. And so it may be a way, these septa may be a way that fungi can control these bacteria better. So, you know, developing a mechanism for ensuring that the fungus can, can degrade the bacteria when they are internalized or when they get in. And uh, anyways, they may have affected this endophytism into fungi may have affected the development of fungi. And so we have more and more complicated fungal types uh, in part possibly because the septa were formed and that enabled the fungus to control the bacteria a little bit better internally. And uh, so fungi don't get overladen with too many of these internal microbes in them. So it may have been, may have been important. I won't go to, I won't talk too much about that, but it is, you know, even fungi may, uh, okay, here actually shows some of these bacteria in fungi. This is a hypha. So a fungus called alternaria, which you, is a common endophyte. So you may, many of your plants will have it and you won't know it's there, but it's, it's there. And uh, the little, uh, this is fluorescent stains. So the little green dots, those are the fungi. I mean, those are the bacteria inside the hyphae. And they tend to be locating at the septa and you can't see the septa, but there's little clusters where you see them. And we think they're, the septa are stopping them. This shows bacteria actually coming out of fungi. You see the hypha and you can see the bacteria now. They're actually, they were actually inside and they're coming out. This to the right shows it. This is fluorescent stain. You can see the whole hypha is fluorescing and you can see the bacteria there coming out in chains. They come out and then they form the form little chains as they come out, make a little pore there and then come out little by little. That's a close-up of it. Over here is a close-up and actually will show. You can, they were actually inside. You can see where the hypha wall is broken a little bit and you see a bit of a bacterium came out and you see the bacteria now reforming right there as they come out. So this is what I'm showing you where you do these connections. This is how you have to do to show that there's an internal and external connection. You actually have to show that. You know, so, so, I mean, you could argue, well, maybe these are just on the surface. Well, yeah, except that we've seen lots of these like this where they go out. And so that's the case. You know, you mentioned you're getting critical, more critical. Well, you, you, that's right, because this is, you know, you, this is how you gain confidence in what you're talking about, right? You're very careful in what you say and how you uh, understand it and how you explain it to other people. So, you know, you, you, you start to do that more and more. The more details you see and the more bits of knowledge you have, then you can kind of put frame things and help you understand how, how other things are working or how related things are working. This actually is from someone else's paper. So those other images are from the lab, our lab, my lab here at Rutgers. And uh, this actually is a hypha from another paper. And the, this bacterium luteobacter, which they've identified, but you could see they're inside just exactly the same way I showed you in those other images. You can see them fluorescent stain now. And this is actually from uh, Elizabeth Arnold's lab in uh, Arizona. And she has been working, she, she's another endophyte person, you know, so all this crazy stuff you guys are hearing from me uh, is also from other people. So I'm not the only crazy one about this stuff, but 
uh, Elizabeth Arnold's in Arizona, and this was published in 2016, has to do with in endohyphal bacteria, they call it, but they're endophytes in fungi, and uh, they do this not exactly like rhizophagy, because rhizophagy cycle is more kind of an advanced process that involves development. This is an internalization, and uh, we don't have any equivalent of uh, cycling that happens, but microbes do get in. They're endophytes, and they do affect the development of the plant. And uh, so actually how they affect the development of the fungus when they get in is they change the behavior of the fungus. And there's instances where some bacteria go into fungi and make the fungus more virulent as a disease agent. Like, for example, there's a rhizoctonia disease in plants. A rhizoctonia is a fungus that when it has a particular bacterium in it, it will become more virulent to the plant. Okay. But typically what we see is when we put bacteria on the fungi that normally are pathogens, they become less pathogenic rather than more pathogenic. And mm. an example, I mean, it's kind of interesting here. This shows a pseudomonad bacterium and a fusarium. Fusarium, you know, is a disease agent and can like cause damping off and uh, lots of other diseases kill plant tissues. Just to the right here, you can see fusarium with a with the bacterium in the middle, looks like the fusarium just grew over it. And you see there's lots of white mycelium there, aerial mycelium. If you looked at the fungus, you would see it's making a lot of spores. But compared, this is with one of the endophytic bacteria. Now this is a pseudomonad that we put in there in the middle. And then we put the fusarium there and you can see it's no longer sporulating. It grows, the bacterium actually grows on the fungus and grows in the fungus and alters the behavior of the fungus. Same thing in the soil. I mean, this is in a Petri dish. And so you could see the kind of branching there, but you don't see that white mycelium, the aerial mycelium, the fungus, and it's not growing as much. The fungus is less aggressive. It's less virulent. So these bacteria are not killing these fungi. And people think that they often think that, oh, this is what we want. We want to get a fungus that's going to kill, I mean, a bacterium that's going to kill fungi and use it for biocontrol. But actually in nature, you don't see that as much, this killing. Instead, you see this behavior change. You put your bacteria there, the fungi aren't killed, but they don't grow as fast and they don't cause disease or they cause very limited disease. They're not, they're not virulent, they're more avirulent. It, it seems like these things are, all these things are different sizes. Uh, I mean, molecular sizes, actually, even. And they just, they all need their own little humic layer to exist on and live on, to take hold and, and live, build a colony upon it upon each other. And that's, it's kind of interesting what you showed about the, the DNA codes, right? The 16 million codes. And, and, it, and when they examined it, it was all these different bacteria all taking host uh, on bigger and bigger structures. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a, this is, I mean, it goes back to what happens in nature. I mean, this is a real good point that you brought up here. What happens in nature is nothing like what we do in our agriculture, right? I mean, we produce mono, monocultures. We oftentimes try to sterilize our soils. You know, if you're doing non-regenerative agriculture, you're sterilizing soils and, uh, in nature, instead, you have nothing sterile. You have only a community of organisms, and th that community interacts with one another and has a property that's different from the collective, right? In, in natural situations, you tend not to see a lot of disease. In, in our agricultural, you know, unnatural cultivation situations, Instead, we do have a lot of, and it's not all from monoculture. Often it's from a decimated soil environment where we don't have the right community, right? We don't have the mix of microbes. There is this concept called suppressive soils, and it's just basically a soil with a mix of microbes in it that prevents disease agents that live in it from actually causing disease. You don't have disease. Those agents are still there but they're not causing disease. And that's because these microbes are interacting with potential disease agents, not killing them, but altering the way they behave. It's a behavior modification 
that happens. And so this is something that people don't really look at behavior modification they in fact a lot of the work to find these biocontrol agents they throw away these really ones that are good and they take only the ones that are inhibiting right and they would eject the ones that don't inhibit the one the kind i showed you before that colonize the fungus but this actually is a surface of the soil and you can see the fungus alone and you see the white soil the way the light i mean you said it's almost like a layer right it's almost like a layer where it forms on it. But with the bacteria, you don't see it there. Mm -hmm. The fungus is in there and the bacterium is in there, but the behavior has changed. The fungus is less aggressive. It's, yeah. a, it's a behavior change thing. And uh, it's a big difference. Yeah, so it's a huge difference. And you don't have disease. I mean, if you, you get a lot of plants, you, you get a lot of seeds, for example, uh, uh, basil, basil, uh, the crop, right? Uh, the seeds have this slime layer on them that also has bacteria in there. And basil is very resistant to disease. But if you remove that slime layer, remove those microbes, they're very susceptible. They, they, you don't get much germination. Uh, disease, disease hits very rapidly early on in seedlings of basil if you remove the microbes. So the seeds actually carry those microbes in them in that slime layer. And other seeds have other ways to carry the microbes. And they that's all part of the community that comes with the seeds, naturally produced seeds. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's important, that, that interaction and uh, that community, the right community. People talk about consortia. You want to develop a consortium. Yeah, but consortium is a community, right? That's going to essentially be good for the plant and uh, suppress disease and so forth. So anyways, endophytes are cool because they also prevent insects from eating plants. And this is something we have not talked about before. And uh, I mean, an example here is this one. I'm not going to talk too much about this because uh, uh, anyways, I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to, there's a lot of details here, but this is an endophyte. This is one of my students did this, worked on this. Iriartea deltoidea, this palm that occurs in the tropics, but there's an endophyte in there, Diplodia mutilla. But the cool thing about this endophyte is here, you can see it on the seeds. The cool thing is it can also be a pathogen and it does a funny thing to its host. Uh, what happens with this fungus, this Diplodia endophyte, is if the plant is in the sun, the fungus becomes a pathogen and it will cause lesions or death in the plant. You can see it below the dead leaves. They're from this diplodia, this endophyte, this fungus. But if it's in the shade, it's purely an endophyte. And uh, oh, I should also say, I will talk about that in a minute, but I should also say this, this is a graph that shows uh, uh, there's a stem borer in this tree and that area, that palm, the more the endophyte is higher the higher the endophyte level in the plant, the fewer insects feed. So the insects don't like this fungus. Chemicals yeah. produced by the fungus they don't like. And so the, the selection for the fungus because of this uh, insect resistance that happens, and uh, the chemical is probably diplosporin or something close to it. We know diplosporin is produced by diplodia, but we're not actually sure. But the other thing that happens is in the shadows, there's no disease that if the fungus, I mean, if the tree occurs in low light, low light intensity, and this actually is a curve that shows lumens light intensity to the lower axis and to the upper, the Y axis, you can see leaf spot growth. And you see where there's low light, you have no symptoms. So the endophyte is in there symptomless. And uh, what this does is it causes the plant to go into the shadows. So these trees will grow in the understory rather than grow in the openings and the forest gaps, right? Where the trees have opened and the light comes through. So uh, they grow in the, they'll be mutualistic and beneficial and so forth in the shadows, but in the sun, then the fungus becomes a pathogen and you have some problems. So the, so the endophyte forces the plant changes the ecology of the plant, forces it to go into the, sh to the shadows. The understory is really, really cool. Wow. It, it, it sounds like it just, it seems like the sun that just, um, I don't know, like it just seems to just dry it out a little bit and a slight uh, environmental change. It, maybe the, the fungus becomes pore-like, uh, like 
I know there's always spores, but just like airborne spores versus living spores, I guess. Like they the spores dry out, like how like on a on a mushroom, the spores dry out and you can recollect the mushrooms, but when they're living, they're I know there's spores, but they don't I, I, I feel like a fungus becomes pathogenic, like it becomes toxic for you when you can inhale it. But when it's living, it's not that bad for you unless you eat it. Well, in this case. I mean, it still may not be bad for you, to be honest, but it's bad enough that the insects don't want to eat it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's producing, in this case, as an endophyte, I mean, in this, in the palm that we're talking about, in that palm, it's bad enough that the insects don't want to eat it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably, if you're thinking about a plant in the rainforest, you know, there's lots of insects around. I mean, it probably also other animals that might eat it are not going to eat it because the chemical is there. So a lot of plants will take in fungal endophytes for that purpose. And they may be manipulating the fungal endophyte in order to make it produce chemicals or the other way around, right? The fungus may be manipulating the plant or maybe a mutual manipulation. But the net effect is that the pair together, the symbiosis together is favored, right? And so... Yeah. And what you're referring to of the consuming, you're right. When the fungus is growing there, it's not going to bother anybody if we don't mess with it, right? Yeah. If we don't mess with it typically. I mean, there are some exceptions like um, uh, black mold, black mold, for example, on, on building sick building syndrome that is toxic. Uh, there's some evidence that, uh, that some of the toxin may come out and affect people that live in uh, in with it or spores might go into the person's lungs but yeah for the most part you know we have plenty of toxic mushrooms and they don't bother us unless we you can touch it and handle them and don't bother us unless you actually eat them mm-hmm. yeah. or they or they dry out and we breathe them in kind of similar to the black spore black yeah. spore one i know yeah. like when it's when it's really wet and and thriving yeah it's yeah. like could be toxic if you just go right in there but becomes really toxic when it dries out and those spores start to actually spread yeah Yeah. especially if you breathe them in yeah exactly like Mm -hmm. so that's why i always tell people is just go it's you know the black mold on your on your shower isn't toxic until it's like totally dried out and you got to go sniff it you know go get go clean it out so this is local weed this is a typical local weed we have local weeds all over the world but especially out west and you know these are cool plants that uh, animals eat and then they kind of have this weird uh, toxicosis in which they get staggers or sometimes they just act crazy right hence the name loco weed and people thought that this was a plant that was one of the one of the most toxic ones really but a toxic plant that's producing a couple and a few different genera uh, but essentially local weeds there's different species of them but they actually turns out they have an endophyte and, and the, it's the endophyte that produces the chemical. And this shows the endophyte. This is what it looks like if you grow it. Uh, they grow real slow, but they're actually related to alternaria, that other fungus that's an endophyte, another endophyte, right? Alternaria that I talked about. But this is, uh, they actually put this in genus Undefilum, Undefilum, and uh, it produced a chemical called swainsonine, swainsonine which is highly toxic, highly toxic. This was published. This was, we used to think these were poison, just poison plants until it was discovered in 2000, around 2008, 2000 something, mid 2000, that uh, it in fact has endophytes that are produced in the chemical and uh, really cool. There's the swainsonine compound and uh, big, and this actually shows the local weed endophyte in the film in local weed and you can see these lines here this is from somebody else's paper so it's not a, it's not our work i didn't discover this one i actually when i was a student was interested in this one to try to figure out but i never found it i didn't i guess i didn't look hard enough i didn't find it it was discovered by some investigators out west who were working on local weeds and they actually discovered that the endophyte is there and the endophyte is producing it but another plant that's like that is uh, morning glories. And uh, morning glories also have ergot alkaloids in them. So sometimes people will use morning glories to try to get the ergot alkaloids out to create LSD. 
right? Because you could get you can get these alkaloids, these ergot alkaloids, and then uh, chemically modify them and produce an LSD and other kind of psychedelics. But the reason these plants, these morning glories, have the ergot alkaloids is because they have an endophyte. They have endophytes in the genus Paraglandula. And again, this is another case where we used to think that. So, the so this is an our. So sorry to interrupt you. That I uh, obviously this okay. is my immaturity. So this is a organic LSD. It's organic LSD. Yeah, that uh, uh, comes from a fungus, also from claviceps ergot fungus, right? But this is a related endophyte that now is that goes into this plant and then produces these same ergot alkaloids like LSD. And I mean, I used to know when I was a student at the University of Texas, I knew a guy who was working on, uh, who would use, who was working on ergot alkaloids and he was actually using morning glories to get his standards because uh, it's easy to get, to collect the morning glories that have them and, and then uh, get your standards out. It's well characterized. So, but it, as it turns out, you know, we knew before that these ergot alkaloids were coming from a fungus that we knew before. And it was thought that morning glories had it too, and that this was a case of convergent evolution, you know, where morning glories evolved it and the fungi, the ergot fungus evolved it. And so you had the ergot alkaloids being involved, it evolved independently. And so it, it's famous. You can find in books where they talk about this convergent evolution for this. But as it turns out, it's, it's false because morning glories have uh, endophyte in it, a fungal endophyte in it that's producing and it's called paraglandula. So if you grew the morning glories to the best of your ability and and put the, and they had all the fungi they needed, and then you collected them all, dried them up, put them in a, a tea, uh, tea bag, mm-hmm. would they create some type of a hallucinogenic or possibly a feel-good experience that would be, a, you would actually feel it beyond just a little caffeine or feeling? Well, people have tried this for a while because there have been some ideas that, uh, people were using ergot for uh, kaikion, which is this a uh, Greek hallucinogenic drink that the Greeks would make. And so they would take uh, the claviceps and take the claviceps and make a drink out of it is what they thought, a purple drink. People have tried this in recent times and and I don't, I don't think it, it actually works. You know, what you get with ergot alkaloids is you get a mix of alkaloids most of which are not hallucinogenic, or they'll make effect, they'll have an effect on you, you'll be kind of depressed, but they'll also have vasoconstrictor, or they'll constrict the blood vessels down, right? They'll have muscular effects, and they'll have nervous effects, but it's not like LSD. LSD is a particular form, right, that particular variant, and you can make variants around it that will have these hallucinogenic effects, you know, fit with the serotonin, and not have some other effects in plants. You have this serotonin connectors right in the in the in the brain, and then affect the perception uh, in that in the block essentially be a, as a serotonin uh, blocker. And uh, serotonin is used for in the body. It's thought that it in the brain is thought to it plays a role in filtering stimuli, and so. Uh, if you block the serotonin receptors using LSD or other kind of hallucinogen, it no longer we're no longer able to sort out what is real and what's not, and so you have these weird, interesting experiences that happen. You know, the, I mean, we go into this more. I mean, we could go into it more. I'm not. I'm not really going to go into it much further, except that you know, where you have a dissolution of the self perception of self and reality and everything else. And, you know, to, it all has to do really with serotonin and the changes that happen in the brain once the, you block those. Uh, do you uh, teach classes of plant spirit medicine beyond just bacteria and fungi? Uh, no, I really am exclusively bacteria and fungi, fungi and plants. plants you, know, and fungi. you know a lot. You know a lot, man. You really do. Uh, on a lot of different uh, sectors. Sorry, please continue. Um, well, I've been studying this my whole life, right? <laughs> Mark? Absolutely. My whole life. I mean, you think, you know, Shows it. why would somebody do that their whole life? Because there's a lot there. Actually, mm-hmm. the more we get into this, the more interesting it is, the cooler it is. Actually, paraglandula, I mean, this this morning glory, morning glory, I have it misspelled again. <laughs> morning glory in the fight, you can, you can see it on the leaves of the morning glory. And you can see it here 
the little white dots, those are actually mm-hmm. fungi, fungi that come out of the plant. This and- appears on the canna plant actually all the time. And I've seen it so many times and I've always, I, I've always wondered if it was uh, like scales or some type of, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for sometimes some of the bugs, they'll secrete an ooze that kind of looks like this too. And mm-hmm. I, I realize now when I see it in this, I realize now it's a, it's a, it's a fungus. People don't really know the extent to which cannabis uses endophytes. We know there's microbes there. I mean, from the experiments that we've done, but you know, it's been regulated enough that it's hard to hard to legally do work on it. Even now, you know, only beginning to be able to really take a look at it. But there may be some important endophytes in cannabis that people haven't recognized. You can see the mycelium, though. See the mycelium? That's from the surface. Peel Absolutely. right off the surface. Peel right and, off the surface. And just spray them down with bacteria, some bacteria, and they, they should get everything should get back under control. It sounds yeah, like that's absolutely right. That's the right ones, right? The right mm-hmm. ones are the right consortium. I also did not do this work with morning glories. Again, when I was a graduate student in the 80s at the University of Texas, this is one plant I was looking at to see if there were endophytes there. And I missed it because it's not in all the plants. But there was a group, a German group that did find it. And this is from their paper. And this was probably 15 years ago, something like that. But you can see this is a morning glory. This is a trichome, the glandular trichome or hair of morning glory. And you can see the bacteria, I mean, the fungi. These are fungi in this case. You can see some of them filamentous, but you're seeing from the edge. So it looks round, almost like a bacterium. The fungi are actually also inside the plant. It's an endophyte. And you can see these little blue dots here. Those are, you can see they're identical to the ones you have out here. Those are the fungi inside these cells and they're actually inside. So these are colonizing these morning glory leaves very early on and they're linking, they're, uh, they're probably coming out of their, or they're, they're have, getting a connection with these trichomes. That's where they're showing them anyways. This was this was one of my failures where I missed it and the uh, another group did another group found it. These are the chemicals that these fungi produce. You can see all kinds of alkaloids in there, and uh, they're all you know these many of these different fun- fungal endophytes are producing these chemicals, and they're affecting. You know, if you take something like morning glory, animals that eat that can get intoxicated, and they just tend not to not to eat it, right? Same with the the other endophytes. Animals tend to stay away from them. Animals that have any sense, you know, sometimes animals that don't know any better, like cattle will just eat anything. Uh, but wild animals can, they, they have some experience and they know and they stay away from these toxic plants with endophytes. There's another one, this is epicloid. This is one that I spent a lot of time studying this thing and a lot of people did. This is epicloid is a fungal endophyte that occurs in grasses. And that first picture that I showed you, so the hypha, the blue hypha inside the grass, that's mm-hmm. this that's this fungus, that's this fungus. And it's also in that ergot fungus. It's also cl- related to that, to the one in morning glory too. And uh, this is in the family Clavicipitaceae. These are common fungal endophytes and they produce chemicals. And this is what they look like in the plant. You can see a hypha. If you take a, took a grass and opened it, split it open, and then looked at it with a microscope, put a little stain there, you could see the hyphae in there in between the cells. That's in the seed. You can see the hypha in the seed. And this spherical things are the embryo. That's the embryo in the seed. It's from the embryo, right? And then the seed coat is out here, and you can see the hyphae underneath that seed coat. So all those grass seeds, when you Take tall fescue or ryegrass, if it has the endophyte in it, many of them will, but if it has the endophyte there, you throw it out and they already have the endophyte in the seed. They're just, it's just waiting there. But they also have in the, in the walls and in the- What are the, those again? Those things that are going back and forth? This is hyphae. This is the- Oh, endophyte. the hyphae. This you is know, the hyphae of the fungus. I, yep. It's very interesting. They just, they move like a river. They do. You know? Yeah. And they, yeah. there's a lot of, have you ever looked at Victor, uh, Victor Schoberger's work? No. Not to go too much into depth, but he talks about how the reason why rivers need to move in a back and forth uh, experience is also for the, uh, how, for water and how it, it gives it energy. And so I just thought, I thought that was very interesting how they move. Uh, sorry. I mean, it's a good, it's a good point. We don't fully understand why they have this pattern you talked about rivers getting energy well you know and if you think about 
if this hypha goes back and forth like this, that also increases the area of the plant that it's interfacing with. And hmm. so there could surface be area. surface area. There could be like a, like you said, the energy, it could give them energy in the sense that they could get more nutrients now from the plant, right? Because so of this. Yeah, no, and it, so the same concept could hold. I mean, you could look at it a number of ways. We don't, you know, it's not 100% clear, right? I mean, obviously, you know, you every time someone says something, you have to be a, a little bit uh, wonder if that's the only the only explanation, right? Because there could mm-hmm. be other explanations for that. And uh, this is where your criti- you're critical, getting critical comes in because, you know, you some people will have one explanation, but if you're aware something else is going on, you right away can know, well, maybe that explanation that that other person is talking about isn't the whole answer, right? So That's it's right. where that criticism comes, critical nature. You can become more and more critical the more you know. Not, not I don't mean critical as criticizing somebody, but just not accepting everything as, you know, even if you're polite to somebody and don't challenge them with it, you know, uh, I mean, still, you know that there could be other explanations, you know, that, and that's where that criticism comes from. But this is, these are structures produced by the, by the endophyte, by this fungal endophyte and grasses. And uh, I'm not going to go into just, much of this. Just to, talk, just to kind of highlight what you just said, that what you just described is a, is a healthy environment before learning, mm-hmm. you know, where, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. like you, right. You don't have not, not not everything has to be challenged and disproved dis, disproven. It, just being there to hear something out and being a whiteboard, uh, I'd allow another person to digest a thought to then get to the next thought when it which ends up being the aha moment. But if there's not that uh, healthy environment, he never he or the other group doesn't express the next idea that ends up being the aha moment. And so I yeah completely agree with you on that. Learning also is a, it is an activity of equals, Mm -hmm. you know, of equals in the sense that, I mean, I may have a lot of experience with endophytes, but for you to learn it, I mean, we have to be communicating closely, right? To see and kind of on the same wavelength, right? And so, I mean, I can't just pontificate. I have to communicate in such a way that there's an interaction and that you can assimilate it and that you could add pieces to the overall knowledge, right? To the overall discussion about it. And uh, that's why I say it's a, it's a learning and teaching are activities of intellectual equals. And uh, I mean, that's the only way it works right, right? That's the only way that uh, we could get to truth. You're a great what teacher, is, man. You really are. Your, your well, students very are fortunate to have you. I want you to know that. Well, uh, thank you. You really yeah. are a great teacher. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. This in the fight, by the way, and this is something you might see in grasses, it, it will come out in some grasses and it forms what's called the stroma. And it forms when the grass flowers and you'll see it occasionally on grasses, these little white bands that form and you can see it here in this picture here. And that actually is like the flower of the fungus of this epicloe, because mm. what happens is there are sperms. We call them canidia, but they are sperms <laughs> that are produced on this. And a fly or other insects will be attracted to these stromata, to these sperms, and they'll come over and they'll walk on this. You can see them here. There's a picture right in the middle. You see that fly, and it will feed on those sperms, and those sperms will actually go through the gut of the fly. And these flies, you can see one here to the left. These flies will, uh, the females will lay an egg on the stroma, and then it will defecate at the same time and put those canidia out there. And it turns out that the mating types are in that those sperms. And so that fertilizes these stromata. And then you get this parathesia that form. And then those little, those wow. little, the egg, the larva. So this is a connection, right? This connection with nature. And so there's insects connected to this that actually fertilize this. And when we published this, we published this back in 85, something like that, in, in an article in Ecologia, uh, the journal, Ecological Journal, and we titled something like that, uh, like a fungus, let's see, fertilization of a fungus by a fly. And it, it was supposed to be similar to, and that was the idea, that's why we called it fertilization of a fungus or pollinaz- pollinization, I think, of a fungus by a fly. And uh, we called it that because it's similar to, to 
bees pollinating plants, right? Was it, fly. Was it even the fly or was it the bacteria in the gut of the fly? It's, it's the fly oh, okay. that carries these sperms around, which deposits the sperms, which, hmm. which, are, which are part of the life cycle of the fungus. So it's the fly that's completing the life cycle of the fungus that's important in this life cycle of this endophyte, this fungal wow. endophyte. Right. Wow. Yeah. So it is it's interesting. But these endophytes and many other I mean, all the, the ones with the, that I talked about with the uh, morning glory and grasses and local weeds, these are anti insect associations. So when they're in the plant, insects don't eat. And this caused a biologist. Keith Clay is his name shown here. who used to be actually. Uh, well, he moved around a little bit. I won't go into the details. Now he's at Tulane, Tulane, but he called this defensive mutualism. And that is that this is a symbiosis, mutualism, right? Based on defending the plant against predation by stuff. I mean, that's what he called this defensive mutualism hypothesis. And he talked about this for 30 years. He doesn't talk about too much lately, but because everyone already accepts it, you know, so there's nothing more to <laughs> nothing more to, to argue the point about at this point, because people believe it. It's certainly part of it. But these epicloia devices are producing these chemicals. And uh, these are different ones, different chemicals, permine, lolines, lolotrims, ergobaline, the ergot alkaloids is one of the ergot alkaloids is ergobaline. Okay, and then lolotrims is another animal toxin, and we have permine. This is an insect toxin, an informal loline, also thought to be insect insecticidal, but they're not. They tend not to be animal. These permine and lolines, but these two definitely affect animals. The lolotrims and the and the ergonocolytes, the baleen, er, ergobaline, but they cause all these problems in animals that graze the grass, and so a lot of money was put in trying to solve this this endophyte problem in grasses, and so. But these are some of the toxicosis. I'll just list them. Fescue foot, summer syndrome. This is for cattle, right? Fescue mm -hmm. foot, I'll show you what that is. Summer syndrome, I'll show you that. Ryegrass staggers, one on ryegrass. Lolium perenni or lolium uh, genus. Sleepy grass, this is one you have not heard about, probably. It occurs in wild grasses. Ueku toxicosis, this is an Indian name from South America. The Amer Indians, I think, down there. This is one of their... I think this is one of their names. This is a hueku, what they call the grass, poison grass. But this is for summer syndrome. Okay, so cows eating tall fescue grass, forage grass with the endophyte, and then they get the, they get they look like this. They call that summer syndrome. Coat is rough. Cattle don't gain weight. A healthy cow in the background, you can see. But ranchers were really upset because you know their cows are all looking like this, and they and they so they put a lot of a lot of money and a lot of pressure on some of the southern universities to solve their problem here, and so they worked a long time. On, it, just uh, yeah. pointing out, this might sound just incredibly stupid, but it just sounds whoa! It just sounds like your diet can lead to uh, loss of hair. It was the diet because, I mean, that's the good point because what's happening here with this, with the grass is these animals weren't eating very much. And when they do, it caused them to have elevated body temperature. This is kind of, you know, you, you mentioned, can you eat these alkaloids, get a concoction of them and then hallucinate, right? Well, what, what was happening to the cows is they were having elevated temperature. They're probably having a, some kind of a mental you know, condition, a depression, right? They weren't eating. They were trying to cool down. Animals would try to cool down and hang around water holes and stuff like that, hang around the shade tree. They won't eat. They wow. won't eat anything because the grass is toxic. And I guess they figured it out. You know, cows aren't that smart, but still, you know, maybe they, <laughs> maybe they knew they didn't want to eat that stuff. Wow. And, and when they do, they get another disease sometimes called fescue foot. And that's because of the vasoconstriction. And it, it goes into the bloodstream Holy and it shit. causes the, the blood vessels to constrict. And then the body, the hooves and the tail would just fall off. They would, it would, no blood would go to those organs and they would fall off. And you can see it up here. This Holy is the, crap. I know it's really bad. And this is what the cattle, I heard instances where ranchers go around their fields, picking up limbs from their cattle, throwing them in fires and you know, getting rid of the animals that are suffering. This shows the fungus in the plant now. This is this is common. You know, you do a 
a Google search and you'll see pictures like this all the time. Endophytes, grass endophytes, they call these are fescue endophytes. And uh, so these are, this is lolotrim. This is for ryegrass staggers. This is the big chemical, but this is, causes a staggers condition in animals. So they'll eat it and they won't die. It won't cause their organs to rot off, but it'll cause them to have this twitching and, and uh, nervous reaction and animals, animals will be psychologically impacted if they get that. I've heard that horses, if they get affected by it, they're never the same. What does that mean? I think some horses are like show horses and stuff like that. And once they get affected, it affects them nervous wise. And then there's, this is a sleep. This is the Tembladera. This is cool. This is that Hueku grass from South America. And they, it's some wild grasses in like Patagonia. And uh, many of the grasses have these endophytes in them that causes a tremble, produces alkaloids that make horses have this staggers again or animals have staggers and uh, uh, something developed called the strategy of Hueku. The Indians would use this and, or the bandits would use the strategy of Hueku and that is when they were being pursued by say soldiers or or posses they would run into these big areas that were dominated by these endophyte containing grasses and uh, the pursuers didn't know what the grass was they would let their horses eat and then, then the horses would become immobilized and then they would have to stop pursuing and the Indians or the bandits could get away. Uh, that's the strategy of Hueku. It's common. It was co commonly known. And you can read about it in Argentina in a book by a lady. I think she's she was very old when I knew her down in Argentina, but a lady named Nicora, last name of Nicora, who wrote a book on grasses. And uh, she describes the strategy of Hueku in there. It's interesting. When, they were in, when I was in the military, just a side note that popped in my head was um, the, one of the schools that I went to was Sioux School, where for POWs and you're, you're captured and stuff and you got to escape and stuff. And uh, they, when you're, they train you when you're being chased by the dogs to you could get some pepper. You know, beyond if they oh, get yeah. close, they teach you how to yeah. kill them. You know, but yeah. if they if, but yeah. it, lead them off the scent, let's get some yeah, pepper. Put pepper there. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. You have to yeah. carry a lot of pepper around when you're being pursued. Yeah, this was like that, right? Yeah, it was just so. This was like that. It's a cool strategy. Well, here's another one. There are one of these in Mexico, in New Mexico, around Cloudcroft, in Utah, in out west, in in uh, Arizona. There's a grass called sleepy grass and it's Agnathrum robustum. And it's called, it's called sleepy grass because it has an endophyte that will put horses to sleep. Wow. And, and so what would happen, it, it was in these mountains that they actually, an area now called sleepy grass campground, but there was so much of this grass there that people, when they rode their horses through those mountains, through the mountain pass, they let the horses feed and then the horse falls asleep for three days and they can't, they're camping there for three days, waiting for the horses to recover gradually. It didn't kill the animal, but it makes them sleep, sleepy grass, in sleepy grass campground. So a fungi will put the animal asleep. It produces lysergic acid amide, a derivative, a, a, a chemical that you could, of course, use to produce LSD, right? Lysergic acid diethylamide is LSD. So this is one of the variants of LSD, right? Wow. It's one of the natural variants, but it makes an animal sleep. Of course, we don't know if the animal was high before it went to sleep. We have no idea. Or if it's having sweet dreams or what, we just don't know. It's just a, a slightly very a slightly different variation of the molecule. You know? It is. It's, it's a variant that has a major so different It's so interesting. Effect. It is. It do, they, is. do they use this lethargic, uh, lysergic acid and, and sleep I mean, I guess it does, does it affect humans in a similar way to make them go to sleep? Do they use it for medicine? That's that's a great question. Modern times, no, but there are reports about some indigenous in Central America that would use sleepy grass seeds. They would take the seeds and they would mm. pound them and put them in water or something and feed them to their babies as a way to quiet the babies. So they would use them kind of like we use like dill for you know dill seed or something for babies that are that have stomach problems right to kind of quiet quiet the baby but those tribes in a book by a guy named hand and i forget exactly what the what the title of the book was but uh it was a, used as a kind of a sleeping agent and so yes it was used it was interesting question and yes historically in primitive cultures it has been used wow so South interesting 
Yeah, it, really, South America, there's another one of these. All over the world, there are these plants. You know, I'm talking about grasses now. These are some of the endophytes that I personally discovered are these, these endophytes that I'm talking about now. But, you know, all over the world are these grasses. And this is one from South Africa in a Melica decumbens that actually it goes by the Dutch name, drunk grass, D-R-O-N-K, grass, right? The Dutch, Dutch name, drunk grass. And it contains an endophyte that is producing other alkaloids that cause toxicity in animals. And native animals don't eat it, but the cattle they don't know any better and they eat it and they get poisoned. Here's one in China. You can see the similar name again. Here they call it, I can't tell you the Chinese name for it, but the translation of that Chinese name is drunken horse grass. Drunken horse grass. That shows it there, but it is a, it is a similar. Animals eat it. And they get this staggers type, so but it's, it, it really is. They're all around us, you know, so in the, these are all endophytes, you know, so all endophytes, you know, we get the idea that all endophytes are good, but yeah, they're good for the plants, but they're not good for animals, right? Necessarily. <laughs> Some endophytes may not be good uh, for animals and, and certainly insects. And, you know, so you have to, you have to, you have to be careful particularly those are fungal and mostly bacterial endophytes are all good. And endophytes of most of the crops that people eat, that people eat are typically not bad and to be good for the plant. Okay. But for animals or for wild plants, there are endophytes there that deter insect feeding. So they're helping the plant, but the animals that eat it aren't being helped by the, by these fungal ones producing toxins, obviously. But the, the endophytes also will protect the plant from disease. And this is something at Rutgers that we did. This is a turf plot. This is a fine fescue plot. And the plot to the left has an endophyte in it, an epicloid endophyte. The plot to the right doesn't. And you can see that there's disease, a disease called dollar spot all over this, all over this. We have a lot of turf breeding at Rutgers. And so this is from this turf breeding program that we have in selection, trying to get the most resistant varieties. And one thing that we did, one thing that was pioneered here at Rutgers was uh, developing fungal endophyte enhanced grass, turf grasses. And so that's what this is, a turf grass. And of course, it's not a forage grass, you know, because it would be a problem, but it's a turf grass. And uh, it, uh, it had, the problem is these endophytes will die in seed if you don't store it properly. And so there's a lot of seed that even if you claim there's an endophyte there, if they claim there's an endophyte there and then someone stores it improperly, the endophyte will die. Uh, so it may die. And so they don't even, oftentimes they don't even talk about having an endophyte there. But this is the insect resistance that you see. This is in ryegrass. And uh, these are ryegrass plants with endophyte that are green. And then these brown ones are dead ryegrass plants that don't have endophyte. So the green ones have endophyte epicloy endophyte and the brown ones don't and what killed them is the argentine stem weevil that argentine stem weevil that's what it looks like and it goes into the plant this is the mama stem weevil it goes in the plant lays eggs and then the there's the eggs that it lays and then the eggs hatch and the larvae then eat the plant out from inside but the endophyte is in there and so they don't want to touch it with the endophyte it makes so much sense now when we talk about a fermentation process process being a pheromone, whatever we want to talk about attracting these bugs is because, I mean, if plants are dead or die, dead, they you want these bugs to break them down before the frost comes in as fast as possible. And that could be weeks in certain, certain places, very fast. And so when these enzymes, which would make sense, right? These this photosynthesis ex experience with these bacteria and enzymes, this kind of 24-hour experience that's cycling through, it just makes so uh, so much sense that these bacteria and fungi, when they're not doing their job, it, it's it's a breeding ground. It's a it's a magnet for bugs. Through it's a and it's yeah. a complex, a lot of complex interactions, you know, in which uh, uh, microbes on plants may be releasing chemicals that then are attracting, like some fungi growing there will release chemicals from the plant, volatiles that then attract insects and insects come and they all start to break down the plant material and it goes back into, you know, it's all part of the ecology. It goes back into the soil then and back into the ecosystem, you know, so the nutrients get cycled. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense of how it all, how it all works and how it fits together. It's a convenient, it all seems very convenient how the system works together. But of course, the system evolved that way. It developed that way, right? It, uh, there was a niche, right? And the, 
their niches, like for example, signaling to other organisms, you know, that's a niche that, you know, somebody had to do it, right? Some mm-hmm. microbe had to do it and uh, they filled it. They go in and they fill it, you know? And so, yeah, it, it all interacts. It's really interesting. But here's another effect. This is a tall fescue. This is one without endophyte. You, this is in the root. And this is this is looking for exudates now, exudates, phenolic exudates, staining phenolics. And so this is a shows a, a, a grass without an endophyte to the left, stained for phenolics. And you see there's this slight yellow around it. I mean, pink, there's a little bit of phenolics, but you see what happens when wow. an endophyte is there. Look at all that. The whole root biology changes. In fact, wow. What we see evidence of is that what's happening in these roots is you have more root symbiosis. When you have the fungal endophyte in the leaves, then you have more bacterial rhizophagy in the roots and more root symbiosis with bacteria. And in some cases, other mycorrhizae are actually uh, more in the roots as well. So you have, you know, you have one symbiosis affecting another symbiosis down in the roots and uh, other chemical secretions from the roots as well, you know, so you have a whole physiology change. Typically, there is this big plant, little plant, or little plant, big plant thing, little plant when there's no endophyte, and then you have an endophyte in there, endophytes in there, and the plants are bigger, right? So you have this thing, this uh, pattern that you see over and over again, big little plant without endophyte, big plant with endophyte. But people actually have taken these fungal endophytes and they found those that aren't producing the toxic alkaloids and they put those in grasses. And New Zealanders, there's a group in New Zealand that did that, ag research, ag research. Over a 10% increase in, in yield difference in their cattle. Wow. Yeah. Cattle grow better with the new endophyte in it because there's uh, compared to either no endophyte or compared to with uh, with the wild type endophyte. And so you can see here, what is this uh, over here? You can see Kentucky 31, that's do, a wild Do they type use endophyte. these as human steroids or illegal steroids for human beings for muscle growth? They don't. Oh. They do not. They do not. No. And I'm just wondering in general, do they use bacteria for steroid uh, enhancement? They, you know, is that... Well, cordyceps, you know, the mushroom, the fungus, one thing that one effect that people think that the cordyceps, right, sinensis, cordyceps, the Mm -hmm. caterpillar fungus, right? One thing, one way that they think that affects people is through steroidal-like compounds in it. Hmm. So steroidal-like. So yeah, people use that fungus. And of course, that fungus is a parasite or a symbiont of insects, hmm. you know, so there may be this interaction there. Steroids here, I mean, is it, I mean, the question is interesting. They don't use this one, but of course we don't know everything there is to know about what this fungus is doing and fungi in this group. And there may be, there are some effects that could be, there are chemicals that could be steroidal-like chemicals that these fungi produce uh, that aren't talked, they're not ergodocalized. There's another class of these chemicals that these fungi are producing in in plants. And uh, people don't know very much about them. I can't can't say much because all I know is the structure, how they are affecting the organisms that consume the plant. I don't know. Very interesting. So this is I think we're at the final leg of what I was going to talk about now, but this is, has to do within the leaves of plants and bacteria now that are going into the plant. These are nitrogen fixing. And I mentioned that already, but just a little bit more. Most people don't, I'll go pretty fast over it. Uh, most people don't realize that there are, well, on the program, you, people do realize it now on on your Imperfect Garden show, they do under, no, realize that because I talked about it before and you guys I'm sure talk about microbes and plants, but they actually are living inside plants and on plants. Plants are, are and this is, a, this is a moss and these baby mosses, you can see this is the shoot of them and you see there's a layer there of bacteria there, and those bacteria are actually going into those leaves. And uh, this, is a, this is another plant. This shows the leaf epidermis, a young leaf and you can see the, brown areas, those are where the cells of the epidermis come together. And this is peeled off of the plant. You can see this, this comes, this is an overlay. This is the biofilm of the fungus, I mean, the bacteria, the bacteria that's on that plant. 
and it's covering those leaves, this developing leaf. And you can see that the shape of the cell, that's because they are right at the cell junctions. You can see them there in those cell junctions. So they cover, they fit right over those junctions. And uh, so something about the cell junctions is stimulating the bacteria to grow. We don't know what it is, maybe simply nutrients coming out, but you can see the bacteria now. Here's another epidermis, leaf epidermis. And you can see the bacteria at those cell junctions. It could be nutrients leaking out. You know, we're theor theorizing it could be, could actually be a... Could, uh, I, could I throw out a, a thought that just kind of hit my head? Yeah, go ahead. You know, again, going back to bacteria, the, and this is only what I, yeah. my understanding is. Bacteria, yeah. Yeah. you have trace minerals, and yeah. then you have enzymes. And then the coenzyme factor for bacteria to produce the enzyme is the trace minerals. And then you have cell division constantly happening. And that through that cell division, you have that DNA code being replicated, those proteins being replicated. And through that replication, there has, to, I could be wrong, right? But the, those enzymes tear apart and, uh, and re-weld the amino acids, peptides, and proteins chains back together. So it, is that they wouldn't that make sense? They'd be hanging out in that spot because that's where through cell divisions it's happening the most. You're right that there are those cell divisions. When it happens, there's more nutrients there. You're absolutely right. That is correct. Why? Okay, so I'll reframe the question. Why do we see this on growing young, differentiating, growing leaves and at the root tips, right, where we have rhizophagy happening, where microbes are entering, then the answer is because there are, that's where all the nutrients are. So, which is what you said, there's more cell divisions there. You put it, you put it as, as there's more leakage there. Well, it's true there's more leakage there, but it may be that there's more leakage there because those cells need to grab it. Right. Mm -hmm. need to grab it, need to grab those nutrients in order to build build up their structure. And so that is an area where there are all of those nutrients are being concentrated. You look at older tissues, like an older leaf, you don't have free nutrients. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the young growing shoot, you're going to have lots of free nutrients there. If you were to take a growing grass and you pulled out a young stem that's growing and and tasted it, chewed on it, it would be slightly sweet on a lot of grasses. If you take an older leaf blade and chew that, you're not going to, it's not going to see the same sweetness. You'll see it's very different. That's because there's fewer free nutrients in those old leaves and many, many more nutrients in those young developing tissues. Some of it is leaking, like you said, leaking out of the cells and, uh, and they can be acquired by the bacteria. But others, I mean, it may be, this may be a, ne a leakage phenomenon. I, we don't know, right? I mean, this is, if I, were to, if I were to say too much, I'd go into the realm of we really don't know. And uh, I couldn't be sure that that's correct. I mean, I would, I, I like to, what I'm looking at, what I'm wondering now is why they're concentrating at these cell junctions, because they seem to be going in at the cell junctions. They go into the tissues and go into the cells at the cell junction. So I'm thinking other crazy thoughts, like maybe there are charges on these cells and it, it moves the bacteria, which, which have nutrients, you know, which may have uh, cations in them. They may be positively charged and the cells negatively charged. Maybe that moves them down into these crevices on the cells or in above the crevices like you see here and, and that's what that would make a lot of sense actually to be right right we were talking about earlier the xylem is the water that's what seems to carry the cation minerals the minerals and then maybe this is a broad statement but the minerals to, that are immobile and then the the other the, the other one the other area it's not the watery area it's like the 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 Flo piece, the phloem carries yeah. that the a lot more the, sugars yeah the sugars right and like kind of like what you were saying it, it would make a lot of sense that in these two areas that work together but there's a membrane in between but there's positive and negatives you know how do they flow together and transport and and release yet they're a magnet and kind of like a magnet in between a wall you know, one magnet dis lets go and then the other magnets fall, fall away or fall off. Well, so you raised the magnet, right? So mm -hmm. let me see. Here's my magnet. That's my model 
of the cell, right? Of the cells mm -hmm. of, the, of the leaf, right? And you see where these, I pull a, a little bearing off and I That's drop That's like a it. trace mineral. And you see it went right there, right? Yeah. At the junction between those two, like you see there. The only problem is in order to get this to work like that, I have to do plus the top one has to be a plus, and the other has to be a minus, and then a plus and a minus. Otherwise, they repel and mm -hmm. all the cells would fly off, right? Mm -hmm. Fly off. So it can't work like that. So if it's magnetism or charges, you know, it has to be done a certain way. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know if that's actually happened. It may be just nutrients. Mm -hmm. Nutrients might be enough, but you have other things that all right, we're not going to go into it because I don't think we're going to solve it. But yeah. something is causing these microbes to go into these crevices, right? And then they're doing this. I mean, this you can see, this is my student that uh, Celeste Zong, who did M-cherry tagging. And so you can see her M-cherry bacteria now. She put it on the plant. And this is from the leaf now, and you can see it inside those cells now, stained cherry color, uh, because that's the tag she put on those bacteria. So you, you see they went right into those leaves. At those junctions, they're, they're more junction. This is inside, but they're, and here you see the bacteria here on the surface, on the outside, but you see them, they're in, inside already. And you, over here, you can see the chains of bacteria there inside those leaf cells. So we can track them in like that. So we know they're going in, but exactly how they move in that mechanism, we don't know. So that's where all the crazy stuff is coming in with the, maybe it's like a magnetic attraction and stuff like that. We just don't know. Nobody studies that. This is the problem. Nobody studies that. People don't think about it. I mean, we've passed that up, right? We passed that up so long ago. I can't, I don't think we ever look at electromagnetism as it relates to plants and animals. It's a rare thing. But now we're doing genomics and stuff like that. So we passed up that kind of uh, thinking about plants and how plants work. But I mean, someday, I, I think it's highly likely that someone will rediscover the magnetism and the attractions and the way plants work with these little charged regions and so forth. I think that could be easily an area that gets rediscovered. But anyways, one of the recent studies we did is trying to look at leaves for the presence of these bacteria that might be fixing nitrogen. And we looked at a lot of trichomes basically for that. Well, trichomes and, and other cells. One of them we looked at was hosta. And this actually shows the hosta epidermis cell. And you can see one cell here. And what you can see here is this is the nucleus in that epidermis leaf of the hosta leaf. And uh, that nucleus, that you can see these little dots in there. Those dots are bacteria. And what you can see coming out of it, you see these bigger dots, right? Those are vesicles that are coming out of those nuclei. And this is stained for nitrate. And so what you see is when it's inside, there's not producing nitrate. But when it comes out, you see the purple. That purple is this nitrate that's being produced. So, so these bacteria are forming in the nucleus, probably the plant. We, we know also because we could stain for sugars that the plant is putting sugar in there. And that's causing the the microbes to proliferate in the nucleus. And then when they come out at some point, then they're, they start to secrete nitrogen. They also secrete ethylene, which actually triggers the plant to secrete superoxide. But this is stained for ethylene here. And you can see that, again, that hosta epidermal cell, you can see the nucleus there. You see it's not staining for ethylene, but when that comes out, when that microbe comes out, it's now producing ethylene, staining purple for ethylene. This is that ethylene stain, blue, blue, both of them are blue. But you see that, that the yeah. microbe is the source of those chemicals, but only when it emerges from that nucleus. Why do we give supplemental CO2 then when, when the bacteria, right after it gets produced out of the nuclei, it starts to secrete nitrogen? So nobody, because nobody knows that these processes are happening in plants or know how they're happening in plants. I mean, this is an area that where we don't understand any of the mechanisms. People know, for example, I mean, this is, we have a whole industry based on the idea that you can somehow put microbes on plants that are nitrogen fixers and that they'll produce nitrogen and the plants can get it. But nobody understands the mechanism. And so we're trying to figure out the mechanisms of how plants actually get nitrogen out of these microbes. So we, we call this nitrogen transfer symbiosis, but they do it inside the inside plant cells. And so that's the, uh, that's the thing that I think have kept people from 
study in this is because it's something that happens in particular plant cells, but inside particular plant cells. And uh, so people only, you know, I mean, this is, we're discovering because we work on endophytes, right? So we're looking at things that are inside plants and how they work, okay? But others, you know, they work on plants and so, or they work on just, I mean, they they have a black box approach. This is a movie sequence, that shows hosta, a hosta nucleus. And you can see, notice there's no chloroplasts in here. That's because chloroplasts, if there's chloroplasts in here, it would produce oxygen. That oxygen would reduce uh, nitrogen fixation. So we, where these cells are going into the nucleus, these bacteria are in the nucleus, and where they release them from the nucleus, you see they're coming out here, and this is stained for superoxide now, so this is going to be a blue color now. In this case, it's superoxide. But what happens is when the bacteria come out of the nucleus, they start to stain purple. And that's superoxide in this case, using nitro blue tetrazoleum stain. But they don't. So what's happening is inside the nucleus, the plant nucleus, the bacteria fix nitrogen, right? And it's surrounded in it, in it with a membrane, a nuclear envelope and all that. They come out of the nucleus, probably in a nuclear envelope or somehow it looks like there's a little bubble there so you could see them coming out and the bubbles gotten bigger and bigger and throughout the bigger, slide too bigger bigger and bigger and i i mean is that because there's more bacteria there or because there may be these bacteria may be secreting uh, we know they're secreting ethylene and nitric oxide at this point uh, and both yeah of and it seemed like gases. the bacteria were grouping in the beginning on the on on the far side and then it got absorbed into it and as it seemed like it was as, as, as it was getting absorbed these outside bubbles are getting bigger it, interesting is it looks like vesicles are fusing yeah like yeah they, they may be fusing into yeah. one into one big thing yeah but what they'll do is they'll actually go out and then they'll move around you see them moving around out here mm-hmm you can see them. That's that cyclosis again. So they'll move around out there. Yeah, they'll move around. And that you don't see. I mean, this is pretty close to what you see through the microscope. You know, you, you typically don't see that. There's a lot going on in plants. Grasses, I won't go into too much, but they have these funky convoluted walls. And as it turns out, these walls are where bacteria are. Look at this. This is a grass epidermal cell. You can see the convolutions. You can see two rods in that one. And this is stained for what is it stained for? It's stained for something nitro. So this is nitro blue tetrazoleum. So that's superoxide. That blue is superoxide. So the plant. So we think that these invaginations that you see in the grasses are actually where the bacteria are. And we think that that makes this more efficient because all the bacteria will go into those invaginations, into those little arms, and then the plant will interact with one cluster, right? instead of all the bacteria getting clustered up and say the end of the cell where the plant can only interact with the whole group, now it has lots of little groups. And so it can get more nutrients, more nitrogen out of those microbes. So in those, in those leaves. So what we think is happening is for grasses, the more they grow, more leaves they form, new leaves they form, the more nitrogen they can get out of the microbes, the microbial endophytes that they're cultivating inside those grass leaves. It's really interesting. And, and basically the bottom line is these what we're finding in plants are not like root nodules, right? Not like rhizobia that have root nodules and legumes for producing nitrogen. That produces lots of nitrogen on the roots in a specific time over a period of time, a long period of time, right? But instead, what we're seeing is bacteria in plant cells that can fix nitrogen, but only when those plant tissues are growing. So it's producing nitrogen right into where the nitrogen is needed in those growing tissues, right? It's very different than rhizobia in roots where you have these nodules that produce a lot of nitrogen and it spreads through the plant. Now we have a system. This is a system that appears like all plants have as far as we've looked, like they have these systems in them, but it works typically in growing plant tissue and not in mature tissue like you have in legumes. So it's a whole different system. So legumes developed an add-on system that they also they also have these other systems in them, by the way. And I'll, I'll show you one of those. Show you, oh, this just shows a one of the nuclei in a grass. 
This is a red fescue, I think, and you can see the orange color there. This is showing reducing sugars. That's stain. The orange is sugar. So you can see the sugar in that nucleus using that orange that it's copper sulfate, by the way. So you can do this at home if you want. Just get copper sulfate and stain your tissues and look at them microscopically. And you can see this. But most, most of these symbiosis that we're finding are in trichomes, plant trichomes. And we think trichomes may be organs that plants developed to do these little mini nitrogen fixation tasks. And this is one, this is from soybean. So soybean have those rhizobia in the roots, but those nodules, but they also have tri in trichomes. And this shows it. This is a trichome from a leaf of a soybean. If you look at a soybean growing soybean, you'll see it has hairs all over it. Well, those hairs all have bacteria in them. And this shows some of these bacteria. This is stained for nitrate. I'm pretty sure diphenylamine, acidified that's nitrate stain. The purple around these clusters of bacteria is nitrate around those bacteria. So they're producing nitrate and the and inside here, there is a, there is a plant cell, that, the hair cell, that is absorbing that nitrate that is produced by those bacteria. At least this is what we think is happening with this nitrate. And uh, this also this shows this is a goldenrod, common weed. We like to work on a lot of weeds instead of crops because, you know, weeds aren't messed with and they still have all their microbes. This is one of the trichomes on a petal of a goldenrod, beautiful yellow flower, goldenrod weed. But you can see the bacteria here. You can see the staining around the bacteria. And here you can see a little bit older trichome hair there. And you can see the masses of bacteria in there. And they're staining purple for nitrate now because they're releasing nitrate into the plant. The plant's getting it, it's going in. Of course, these are on growing tissues. So they're not coming from the root that goes through the plant. It's, it's right in the tissues as they grow. This is what plants do. Here's another one, you know, that you're familiar with. And uh, this is my student, April Michi, working on it. She's trying to finish up her PhD now. It's been a long haul for, for her, but it looks like there's some light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, she's been working on, on some of these trichomes. And uh, with hemp, you have these glandular trichomes on the, on the leaves and on the flowers, on the inflorescences. And uh, they have these heads. And of course, we know those heads get filled with chemicals with the terpenoids and the various cannabinoids and other kinds of chemicals that will go in, produced in there. Uh, but they're also full of bacteria. And those bacteria are fixing nitrogen. And notice also, notice that the stalk is green, but the head is not. And the, uh, that's because there's chlorophyll, there's chloroplast in the stalk. But if there was chloroplasts in the head, it's increasing the oxygen, oxygen that would inhibit that would inhibit, inhibit the nitrogen fixation, nitrogen fixation, nitrogen fixation. You're and a great you, teacher, brother. I'm picking this stuff as you as you as you're laying it, down, man. It's it's. I mean, it all makes sense, right? It, it all makes sense. If nature, nature is logical. There's nothing that I mean. There's many things that we don't understand, but it's all understandable by us given time, right? And by, I mean, the processes that we're talking about are logical processes that you can see and you can understand. Any human can understand as well as, 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 well as a professor, right? I mean, we're all intelligent beings and, you know, we, we use that intelligence to understand this, but we also use it to interact and explain it and to learn it. There's a there's a technique in, in in extraction when you're going from the crude oil to the isolate and in the distillation process when you get to the higher level of distillation there's a specific technique there's many ways to clean up the oil and uh, and isolate it down but one of them what is and I've never seen it use, done before except for one of my friends he uses a bacteria actually and that was really interesting what you just said right there he How does he uses, do it? Well, he he puts the bacteria into the distillation uh, prior to the distillation process, and it I didn't know what it did, did until you just pointed it out right there. It probably does something where it pushes the chlorophyll molecule or the nitrogen molecule or the green molecule or something away from the THC. And uh, he puts it in there and it, it reacts over a course of a couple hours or something like that. And then he goes through the distillation process and it, and it helps separate the chlorophyll molecule out of the, and the debris out of the oil. 
That's really interesting. So they may be breaking down the chlorophylls maybe or absorbing the chlorophylls using microbes to absorb mm -hmm. those bits. That's interesting. Well, yeah. let's talk about this. This is this because this is exciting too. This actually shows glandular trichome early in development and this is stained for superoxide. So the plant is producing this superoxide and putting it on the microbes, but you can see the rods, see the bacterial rods and clusters here. You can see there's a little one there. Look at that. You can see the rods in there, but you see just a tiny bit. And there's other places. You can see bacteria around here, bacteria beginning to develop. And in this phase, this early phase, the bacteria have their cell walls, so they're the rods, but this superoxide strips those cell walls off. And you get this a little bit earlier on. And these are all this whole area. This is all microbes out here. These are those L forms, these, these protoplast phages. So they're without cell walls. And you can see the, the trichome cells here. There's eight of them. This is part of the trichome. This is the plant cells in the middle here. And you're looking, now you're looking through the head and you're looking at the, underneath, you can see the green there. That's where, that's in the stalk where the chloroplast is, so you can see the green, but you see it's not out here. And this is stained for superoxide, so you can see the superoxide is at the interface of the plant and the fungus here. And so it's just like cooking these bacteria. You can actually see, I mean, it looks like, well, there's since darker blue here, but there also must be some kind of percolation that's happening with these microbes. They must be moving around. I don't know how they're moving around if they, or if they're really moving around because we don't see it that much, but there must be some kind of percolation going on, some continual cooking and then percolation and so mm -hmm. forth. As the, as the plant gets these microbes to secrete nitrogen. So we think this is a way to get nitrogen. And uh, we think that the chemicals in these glandular trichomes and trichomes in general are, I mean, there could be some anti, you know, most people say, okay, these terpenoids, these uh, cannabinoids, maybe they're anti-insect, right? Or anti-herbivory or something like that. And that could be that they have that effect. Certainly it's possible, but they also are known to be antioxidant and and, uh, you know, most of the, like THC itself, most of the terpenoids, cannabinoids have these oxygen scavenging properties. And so, and, and the other interesting thing is they are chemicals, compounds that lack nitrogen. So if, if they are truly kind of ways to scavenge oxygen and reduce the oxygen exposure to the microbes that are there, then, then, they're, then they're very efficient at that because they don't actually use nitrogen in their structure, right? So they don't have nitrogen in the cannabinoid structure, uh, but, they, but, they, uh, but they absorb oxygen. So in absorbing that oxygen, they could enhance the nitrogen fixation in the microbes and extraction of nitrogen from those microbes. And then, uh, and, and also the important thing is you would say, well, it doesn't seem consistent that, oh, we have superoxide. Yeah, but notice how limited, superoxide has a very limited distance. It's not like molecular oxygen. Molecular oxygen in the air can go around, it can hang around everywhere, but superoxide has a short range. And you can yeah, see like you right said too, it happens fast. It's not like it hangs out for a long period. It's like so it's quick. Yeah. It's so, it allows yeah. for a whole other environment yeah to yeah. exist at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And we don't know. What we don't know is a lot, right? What we do know or what we think is very little, right? Compared to what we don't know. We don't know, for example, does this happen more in the day or more in the night? Or is there a day-night factor to it? Is it a fertility plant thing? Is it a growth regulator? I mean, you know, how is the plant regulating it? How does it, how is it happening? I mean, you could have, for example, superoxide happening during a certain point, and then uh, at another point, it doesn't, right? It doesn't form. So then you have this alternation of when nitrogen is fixed and then when it's extracted like that, you know? So we just don't know. We don't know anything about that. There's so much, you can think we're only seeing it. We're only looking at it and staying, seeing it with these, these histochemical stains that we're looking at, developing hypotheses and understandings about it theories, so to speak. Here's all of our, a bunch of our terpenoids, our cannabinoids. You know, if you notice, you just don't nitrogen in there. I don't see any nitrogen in any of them, right? Uh -huh. So they won't waste nitrogen. They may waste carbon. This is carbon and this is oxygen. 
oxygen and carbon, some hydrogens, hydrocarbons, but you don't have nitrogen. So they're not going to waste the nitrogen they're producing. They can scavenge oxygen, and we don't know how all of them work, but they could scavenge nitrogen, oxygen, scavenge oxygen, and uh, uh, directly into their structure somehow. I mean, I don't know, you know, there's some, there's going to be some cannabinoid chemistry that might play a role. And if I knew more about it, I might be able to understand how, how this is absorbing oxygen, but I, I don't know much about cannabinoid chemistry other than basic organic chemistry, you know, and like most biologists, I've had organic chemistry and biochemistry, but. Well, it was like you said, right. And uh, tell me if I'm making the proper connection in the trichomes that was, it wasn't green because it's, it wasn't green because there's not producing photosynthesis not and produce- there's no oxygen being liberated. Exactly. But, you, the but in the trichomes, the air, yeah, go ahead. there's no, there's no nitrogen in the trichomes. So there's like, but the trichomes is where the bacteria is fixating the nitrogen and bring it in for the chlorophyll. And that's, and, but and there's no nitrogen. Exactly. Transferring it to the plant. And then the plant can take that, those cells. If we look at those cells again, Go back to those cells. These cells have to then absorb that nitrogen yeah, it's, produced by these microbes, right? So presumably, right in here, I guess, where it's hitting it with superoxide is where the the I go microbes, back to osmosis. You know, it's like this. It's like it this person um, osmosis experience where the the os the osmotic membrane is the oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. And what's transferring through or what's mobile is the nitrogen. And it just, I'm, that's how my brain's seeing it or how yeah. I'm interpreting it. And they're absorbing it. They have active, they have uh, plants have uh, nitrate uh, transporters and, uh, and uh, I, they also have ammonia transporters. But I think in this case, most of these forms of nitrogen are fully oxidized by this superoxide. So the Nitric oxide is produced, it becomes oxidized by this superoxide. And then the plant here, the plant cell can then absorb it right out of this interface, right? It can mm-hmm. just take it right away. And so it's like you said, diffusion, the membrane, there's a, I mean, you can almost look at this. If you look at this, this interface, it almost looks like it's hard to tell what the difference is between the bacterium cell and the plant cell mm-hmm. out here. I mean, they look so, they look, they look like they just bleed together yeah right it just bleeds together so you're going to have this nutrient exchange so in that uh, you know it's very stimulating when you think about how nature works and that that humans you know we're highly sophisticated in what we do and but we don't we really know. don't know we really <laughs> have only scratched the surface we really don't know i mean what is it einstein said you know he could there's a song that says Einstein said he could never know it all. He could never learn it all. Uh, that humans may not be capable of learning everything. Well, I mean, we we are capable of learning it, I think, but we know so little as it is that, and and we're missing a lot of it. Like this is something that we missed. I mean, what for example, what do you know of trichomes? What what are trichomes? They're plant hairs, right? They're plant hairs. What do they do? Nobody knows. <laughs> They have chemicals in them. Some of them do. Some of them don't. Uh, What do they do? Okay, maybe they stick up. And if an insect comes along, it trips the insect. That's kind of crazy. I doubt that. Uh, They're soft. Insects can bite right through them. Animals bite right through them. You know, they're, here's another plan. God gave to us just for our sure enjoyment. Give us, exactly right, exactly right, exactly right. Exactly right. Here's another one. Here's hops. If you like beer, you know, you like those. Sheer enjoyment right there too. We, we are living in the garden of Eden and we we don't even recognize it. We We don't recognize it every day. Look at these things. They're, they're just, they're just right there. They're just, they're just hanging right there for us to grab and enjoy. And And there's all kinds of stuff happening in them. Yeah. Like this, here's the glandular trichomes on the hops combs. Right, you can see the this is stained for bacteria around this boot nitro blue for superoxide again, nitro blue tetrazoleum. And you can see the blue, those are the bacteria, clusters of bacteria. And these are some of the cells that the so they're kind of mixed up in there. And this is what it looks like when it's fully developed. And you can see the this is one of those 
bracts or little leaves that were part of the cones, right? And you can see the cells that were part of the cone cells. And you can see this is stained for nitrate. You can see they don't stain very purple. Those cells are just regular epidermal cells, but you see the glandular trichome now, you see how purple it is. That's full of nitrogen. These glandular trichomes are making nitrogen. And then the plant is able to acquire that and move it into this growing tissue. So you see these trichomes on young growing tissues. So, you know, in cannabis, you know, and you want, you want, uh, you want the uh, flowers, right? The inflorescences is what we're using, the growing inflorescences. You don't go for the mature tissues because the inflorescences is where these processes are going on, nitrogen fixing is going on and where the plant is putting all these terpenoids, chemicals in, uh, we think, to reduce the, to scavenge oxygen, ox oxygen scavenging. So the same thing happens here. All of these glandular trichomes are gonna be very similar. And uh, people also, I mean, just to go on another topic a little bit, uh, people also look for medicines in endophytes. So a lot of people are isolating endophytes to make medicine, to ferment them, to get the fungus out, or get the bacterium out, ferment it in a fermentation culture, get the chemicals it's producing, and then check that for medicinal effects. You know, we're talking that. about medicine the whole time, from sleeping a sleeping aid to steroids to muscle enhancement. You know, I use the word that's an aggressive word like steroids, but I call it just muscle repair. You know, it's um, yeah, you know, yeah. while you're yeah. hurt or, or or whatever, you know, and yeah, I find that to be incredibly interesting you know, that we can possibly use a fungi or bacteria to, I mean, you like, who knows what the ability for a bacteria and fungi to repair because aren't, we are bacteria and fungi, right? So if we put in, they could, we have a lot, we have a lot of in us, both yeah. bacteria and fungi, right? Mostly bacteria, but we have some fungi, different kinds of yeasts in our system, different, you know, we have, we have both bacteria and fung fungi in our systems all over us. It makes sense that one of them yeah. could help repair blindness or help, you know, like, you know, Alzheimer's or, or cancer or, or like you're talking about, um, you know, arthritis, you know, like too it does. law of minimum, law of, law of tolerance, you know, it's like too much of one, yeah. not, not like maybe we have a, a bacteria, maybe we have a fungi dominant system because the pH is messed up in our pH in our gut system and bacteria can't do the job. And that's the reason why we're getting arthritis or something. I have yeah, no you're, idea. You're, you're right that, um, that a di an imbalance can be fungal. Could you have yeasts? If you take antibiotics, for example, you knock out your bacteria, you could get a, a Crohn's disease or IBD or some long-term problem because you leave only fungi there, or you leave only the endospore formers, the bacteria that are forming endospores, and you knock out all your, the community is decimated, right? So you have only thing left that makes you sick and can go throughout your body. And I mean, that happens, that happens also with the yeast infections. So Candida, for example, people take antibiotics or they get stressed or something like that, throws the system off and the Candida grows, but the other microbes may not. And so mm -hmm. you, you get a, you get a dis, the so-called dysbiosis, right? Which is a messed up community. You know, you get, you get a, you may have to have a, a fecal, a fecal gut implant or something, you know, or, <laughs> or get some of those microbes, but people know, I mean, this is, this is the thing back to the medicine. Again, there are people all over the world that they study in the fights for one reason, and that is to find medicines, and uh, so, I mean, this is, it's a big field. It never used to be so big, but it's partly large, so large because so many of the people are looking for microbes that produce medicines, anti-cancer drugs and stuff like that. Gary Strobel in, uh, in uh, North Dakota, or was it South Dakota? I can't remember. I think it's North Dakota, was a pioneer in that area. And, uh, but now there's people all over the world looking for drugs by screening endophytes. Even Merck used to do that. I have a friend here who re retired from Merck, well, who left Merck years ago, but only after they got rid of their natural products because they had been screening plants to isolate microbes or screening microbes to try to see if they would produce stuff for medicines. They eliminated that program. Now other companies are doing it, but people are still doing it. The other interesting thing is that 
you know, because this is a way, because we get our gut microbes from foods we eat, it, it's possible to produce foods or to eat foods that have lots of microbes on them and enhance our own gut microbiome and our own health, right? So, I mean, it may also be possible to put microbes, say, for example, if you wanted to create a probiotic crop, some sort of a crop, you know, by a broccoli, for example, putting, putting say, ferments, say, uh, uh, I don't know, compost washes or something like that, or ferment mix of microbes that you ferment somewhere, put those onto your developing plants and the food crop and get them to internalize into the into the tissues and then people could consume that and obtain some of those microbes that were in the ferments or the uh, the the compost washes or whatever whatever is produced so it's possible to kind of create probiotic crops uh, not in the lab but uh, and it's not necessarily artificially but intentionally right not just what you have in nature of course bio Bioprospect, bioprospecting for endophytes, and, and these are some of the chemicals that people have found. Some of the drugs, lots of antimicrobials. Strobel, Gary Strobel, I mentioned that name from uh, North Dakota. Uh, that was uh, he's the the senior author there. He's an old guy now, like me. He's I think he's older than I am. Uh, Taxol is one that he found produced by fungi. It's an anti-cancer mm-hmm. medicine, and uh, basically for plants, endophytes help plants in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, I won't go into the details, but we've talked about the ways plants need the microbes. If you remove the microbes, plants are sick. Just like if we took away all our microbes, we'd be terribly sick. Plants are sick if you remove those microbes, they need it. And so, you know, seed sterilization practices and stuff like that are probably not a good idea. You know, putting microbes on, it's, it's a good idea. Having regenerative soils is a good idea. You know, probably ferments, adding ferments and adding, uh, you know, compost teas and sorts of things, not only add uh, nutrients, but also add microbes to soil. Those are likely good ideas. Adding individual microbes, other biostimulants that stimulate the growth, uh, things like, uh, uh, for example, humates. People will use humic acid they'll put on plants. Well, it turns out humic acid actually stimulates rhizophagy cycle in plants and makes plants internalize microbes more, you know, so they're, and if you put microbes there, of course, that's a direct stimulation of of rhizophagy there. So, I mean, there's all kinds of side effects that plants get. Plants are more resistant to stress if if they have the microbes. If they don't, they're sick. If you put too much nitrogen on plants, you'll inhibit these processes, like you'll inhibit nitrogen fixation completely. And so you don't get the benefits of natural nitrogen fixation if you're putting nitrogen on chemical nitrogen on plants so anyway what is that how did that get in there there we go so these are all the people that helped and uh, they did this over a long period of time did who did the work actually there we can... i asked all my questions in our in our I yeah I know. <laughs> nice. I, know. I know i know it's time it's over time anyways we're six minutes over really Mr. White, thank you so much for this conversation today. Once again, I I have thought about our conversation hundreds, if not thousands of times, even right before running this morning. I I just grab I have I had my fermentation uh, material and I I actually grabbed it. I foliar sprayed all my plants, making sure that all the microbes were on the on the leaf surface. And right before our conversation. And Knew I know that that was important before our conversation, but after our conversation, it it, it, it created this. The amount of times I've thought about it, it it is created this, just a new level of appreciation. And every time I talk to you, it just gets more in depth. And you just, I just realized, I just once again, you know, like we we're holding an apple, right? But we don't realize how many moving parts were were you know, they had their hands in the pot to make that one apple you made, you know, and it, it, it makes me want to, when I eat that apple to eat every last possible part of that apple and not just a couple bites, set it down, walk away. And it, it actually makes me want to take a, a, a much slower approach to my food and, and, 
and instilling it in around like just a you know a larger appreciation to what it and takes we're getting to create it. and we're getting microbes from those foods too you know mm-hmm. so i mean a tomato right a tomato or a squash they're actually filled with bacteria inside them you know all plants you know broccoli is loaded with bacteria you know so many of the vegetables that we eat many of the foods we eat we don't people don't realize it you know we're afraid oh there's bacteria in it uh, we have to clean it off or get the bacteria off but actually they fill they fill it they're inside it already they're around the seeds they're in the fruits so when we eat them we're taking some of those bacteria I mean, if you consider tomato for example a lot of the endophytes in tomato are the same ones we have in animal guts so the bacteria, there may be an actual movement between the human, between plants and, and animals in these microbes that they go from guts to internal tissues of plants, plant roots to guts of animals. And just, and this is another, you know, thought of another parallel, you know, you think about it, the animal gut is like a root in that it is the structure that absorbs the nutrients, Right from mm-hmm. soils. Okay. And the uh, same with roots, you know, we have microbes there just like we have in guts and we're absorbing, we're absorbing, we're processing microbes and we're absorbing nutrients, you know, so the gut and the root are comparable organs, both involve mm-hmm. microbes, both involve microbes, plants and animals are not so different in the big picture of things. You know, we both come out of that primordial soup that primordial slime, right? Plants went one way, animals went the other. Mm. You know, we, we carry that primordial slime in our, in our guts as animals and plants cultivate them on their roots and move them throughout their structures. So they are, we still carry, both of us carry that primordial slime, the microbes around with us that we started out. We evolved in, we evolved with those, we still have them. Mr. White, thank you so much for coming on to the channel. I you're welcome. Uh, you're welcome. appreciate everything. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Mark. Guys, please remember to like, share, and subscribe only on Perfect Gardens TV. And I guess my question would be, can you add pure RO water into an organic living soil or can it potentially strip minerals or, or hold on to it since it's so hungry or it has nothing in it to where even when you stir it, you know, the, it, it goes extremely acidic.